Okay, um, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the ICRA 2020 workshop on emerging learning and algorithmic techniques for data association in robotics. My name is Kaveh Fetian. I'm a postdoctoral uh, associate at MIT's Aerospace Control Laboratory. And together with uh, John Ha from MIT, Alec Koppel and Ethan Stump from ARL and Roberto Tron from Boston University, we are pleased to have the opportunity to organize and uh, organize this workshop and host this event today. Uh, okay. So, uh, so first thing I want to mention is that I hope uh, wherever you are joining from, uh, you and your loved ones are well and safe in this pandemic. And we understand that uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to interact with the speakers and ask questions in this virtual setting. But uh, we, we uh, saw a, a, a great uh, deal of benefits in having a, workshop, a virtual workshop uh, because we believe that we can relay the message to a greater and larger set of uh, audience, people who uh, probably could not uh, attend the ICRA workshop uh, originally. Uh, so uh, we, uh, regarding to that, I want to mention that we are live streaming the event on IEEE TV. You see the link here. Uh, this link, by the way, is also on the workshop web page. So I would like to start and uh, if, uh, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the workshop schedule and how we are uh, organizing it and how you can interact with the participants and ask questions. But before doing that, I'd like to pass the microphone along to other workshop organizers so they can relay their welcome messages to you and we'll come back to the logistics of the workshop. John, would you like to uh, go ahead and uh, say? Uh, your welcome message. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a shame we can't be in Paris, but uh, it's good to see everybody online. Um, and I'd like to second uh, Kevin's thoughts that I hope you're all safe uh, and that uh, this format might actually allow more people to attend the meeting. Uh, we look forward to the exchange of ideas today. Um, and um, I would just like to caution that uh, because it's a strange format, we have to be very careful in terms of uh, keeping microphones muted and uh, trying to find uh, ways of interacting um, through asking questions through Kevi. So I'm sure he'll go through the instructions. Anyway, looking forward to the talks today and uh, I'll, I'll see you as the day goes on. Thanks, John. Uh, Ethan, would you like to uh, relay your welcome message? Sure. Thanks, Kave. Uh, so I'll also echo my uh, concerns for everybody. Hope that you're all doing well. Uh, so we're very excited about this workshop. Um, you'll see if you go to the, the, the website and look at our expected outcomes, you see we actually have a range of really interesting questions that we're trying to get after. You know, there was some, there was some concern at different folks we talked about in the community that a workshop like this about data association was just way too niche to really fly at ICRA. And so I think the fact that you know, we were able to convince the community that this was going to be a worthwhile effort, I think is a testament to kind of the excitement of the progress that's going on in the community right now. So I think, you know, we, we should all be looking forward to a lot of really interesting talks. We might learn a lot of really cool stuff about uh, things that are going on and, and things we might be looking forward to. And so with that, I think we should, um, I think it's Rob Roberto's turn. Thanks, Ethan. Roberto? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Hi, uh, I'm Roberto Tron. I'm a assistant professor at Boston University. And I'm really excited to be honored to be part of the organizers of this workshop. As Ethan said, I feel it's a very emerging area with lots of exciting research. So I'm looking forward to lots of great talks. And uh, it's a pity we cannot be in a cafe in Paris and share croissants and cappuccino uh, uh, during coffee breaks. But um, 
I'm sure the, we'll get uh, some good interaction going on with the chat and uh, uh, asking questions. And um, I have my family is in Italy, which was um, uh, hit by the pandemic quite hard. My parents are fine, but um, I'm, as uh, the other people, the other organizers said, um, uh, I'm thinking about all, uh, everybody who was affected and I hope your family is safe. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, so I would like to now uh, talk a little bit about the workshop schedule. Uh, so just to give an overview of the workshop, we have uh, 12 talks today uh, by prominent speakers that we're very grateful that they accepted our invitation and agreed to come uh, give their talk uh, in this new virtual setting, which is perhaps a little bit difficult for all of us. Uh, so we, thank you for that. Uh, we are asking all of our speakers to limit their talks to 15 minutes to allow five minutes for questions. Uh, we will ask them to discuss and, present and, and talk about their thoughts on existing challenges in the field, future research directions that they see in data association, uh, both learning and algorithmic methods, as well as the applications in robotics, computer vision. We also have two spotlight, spotlight talks by uh, authors of accepted papers. These papers, by the way, are available on the workshop's webpage. Uh, I invite you to go and check them out. Uh, the spotlight talks are going to be 10 minutes each uh, in terms of presentation with five minutes uh, following for questions. And uh, so as of this morning, we actually had over 400 uh, registrants, so uh, as of a few minutes ago, so we're very excited to see this number of uh, participation. Uh, so the workshop schedule is available at the workshop web page. Uh, we invite you to go and check it out at any time. Uh, but here's like an overall uh, schedule for today. Uh, the most important thing is that we have four themes for the workshop. The first theme is going to be on mathematical model and algorithmic methods for data association. The second theme would be on learned model and end-to-end -end methods, uh, data-driven approaches. And uh, the third theme will look into applications of these techniques in robotics, computer vision. And the uh, theme four will be looking at intersection of learning and algorithmic methods. Uh, so originally, when we when we organized the workshop uh, for France, we had four sessions, and each session was on the theme. But now, in this virtual setting, we have speakers from all over the world, and we had to kind of reshuffle the talks uh, based on the time zone that the speakers are in. So we are going to start our first session in a few minutes uh, with our speakers in Asia. Uh, and then we go to our European speakers, following that uh, speakers in uh, Eastern United States and then Western United States that afternoon. We have a coffee break from 10 to 10.25. All the times that you're seeing here are US Eastern time. And then we also have a lunch break from noon to one. Uh, so here's the important part that uh, tells you basically how you can interact with your speakers today. There are two methods. Uh, one method is, uh, well, first of all, I, I need to let you all know that we muted all the participants because uh, we, had, we are expecting a large number of attendees and we want to minimize any unwanted interruption. So if you want to ask a question from our speakers directly, verbally, uh, we, we ask you to indicate that uh, you want to ask a question by pressing the rise hand button. And the way to do that is, there's this little icon that's, uh, that says participants at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You click on that and a panel opens up on the right and you see this uh, raise hand symbol. So press that and this, the session chairs will get notified that you, you're interested in asking the question. Uh, we receive these uh, requests in order and then we go through and unmute you and invite you to ask your question. Uh, the second method is that you can type your question in the chat Perhaps this is a little bit more straightforward. So you just click on this chat icon at the bottom of Zoom screen, and then the panel opens up, and then you type your question. Your questions will be visible to everyone. 
And what the session chair do is that we go through the questions depending on how much time we have, uh, depending on how many questions we, we get. We may need to select only a few questions to ask, ask from our speakers. So uh, we apologize in advance if we miss your question and we encourage you to uh, email the speakers and ask them directly if we don't have enough time to, to cover your question. So I think uh, we, uh, we can go ahead and start our first session in the morning. I'm going to be chairing the first session. Uh, we'll have four talks. Uh, Ayong, Xiaowei, Florian, and our last talk is going to be a joint talk by Caesar and Juan. Uh, and uh, Ayong, are you are you ready? I can go ahead and introduce you if you're ready. And uh, sure, yep, I'm I'm ready. So you want me to start? Yeah. Do you want me to sharing my screen or are you? Yeah, in a minute. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a little bit bio about you and then we can share the screen. Okay. Sure. Okay, so Ayan Kim is an associate professor in the engineer uh, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology case. She also holds uh, she also has a joint affiliation at KI Robotics and the School of Computing at case. She received her PhD degree in mechanical engineering from University of Michigan Ann Arbor. She also worked as a postdoctoral researcher in naval architecture and marine engineering at UM and at ETRI as a senior researcher. And her interests are uh, visual, visual simultaneous localization and mapping and navigation. And I, I believe that it's nighttime in Korea. So uh, yeah. thanks for uh, agreeing to come and give your talk at this hour. We appreciate it. And we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, please take it away. Yeah, no problem. Okay, um, I'm gonna share my screen then. Um, this this will stop others screen sharing. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go for it. Okay, I uh, hope everybody can see my screen. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, hello. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. I hope everybody is safe. Um, so I'm in uh, South Korea, uh, we are nighttime. But before starting my talk, I wanna thank to all the organizers that who made this kind of very hard workshop happening like this uh, virtually. Uh, so I'm gonna start my talk about um, the learning motion and place descriptor from LIDARs for long-term navigation. So like I uh, introduced, my name is Ayong, Ayong Kim. I'm working at uh, KAIST um, at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering with a joint affiliation in a school of computing. So the date association for me, I'm a SLAM engineer. Um, I, I'm in the Civil and Environmental uh, Department where my major concern is how can I make this uh, urban environment um, sensible? So I use a lot of LIDAR to um, make the robot moving. And one of the talk, these are the three topics that I wanna um, introduce today within 15 minutes. First, I wanna talk about the LIDAR descriptors for long-term navigation. I wanna start from that. And I wanna uh, spend some time on I can, how, I can, how we can learn motion from LIDAR. And lastly, um, this is one of the paper that we uh, we will present virtually in ICRA 2020. So we found there are not many data, uh, data set for the place recognition researches for LIDAR or radar range sensors. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Do we have enough data set for the PR or data association problem for when you're using LIDAR or radars? Okay, uh, so here's a little bit of the motivation that I have. Uh, it's, it was 2015, five year, years ago, <clears throat> and it's in the Seoul, and government allowed us, they blocked the streets in Seoul. It was very early in the morning, in Sunday morning. There was only us, traffic was controlled, and the illumination was very uniform, and we were able to capture a very clean city without having any traffic. A uh, little later, we went out after the traffic <laughs> is on again and you see a lot of cars, the sun rises and there's a pedestrian uh, 
And as you see, um, the camera looks different. And of course, there's so many cars. So that, this is kind of motivation for me. Um, there's a visual changes, of course, but there are dynamic objects and other structural variants happening at the same time. These are two same places. How can we make successful data association overcoming all these challenges? Um, so I want to start from uh, scan context. This is our 3D place descriptor. It used to be a LiDAR descriptor, but I think uh, I changed my word because the paper that we will present this ICRA 2020 is about the range uh, data set, including LiDAR and radars. Um, this scan context, let's say we, when we have a map of the environment, like this is one of the city in South Korea, Pangyo, um, you have a 3D map, but my quarry sensor, onboard sensor is LiDAR. How can I match my existing uh, incoming scan to the existing map? That was my um, research question at the time. Um, our start of the this research was not actually from the robotics. Um, there was, um, because I'm in the civil engineering department, there was a professor who was working in the urban designing and planning. And his interest was how can we measure the openness around us? Let's say people uh, uh, standing right here, he or she may feel uh, how, feel uh, looking around the space around him or her. So the question is, how can we measure how much volume that we have open um, above us? So it was actually easy because once we have a point cloud data, data set, we can actually calculate the volume um, by just calculating how much space is open out of this uh, hemisphere. And when we were working on that, we found out what determines the openness is majorly determined by this highest view limiting point. That's basically the highest, the maximum height of the building. So we, starting from there, we came up with an idea if this kind of sky, skyline like descriptor could be uh, meaningful for the data association or loop closure detection. So that's what we did. Um, having X axis is an azimuth angle and Y axis is a range. So I'm gonna show you in more detail in this video. So um, what we did is we downsample um, and if we look into this point cloud from the top down view, having a, this kind of pol polar coordinate and having um, each column in this two dimensional descriptor, uh, having X axis as an azimuth and Y axis as a range and each pixel value is the highest building on that location, on that grid. And we pipe this one um, into our search algorithm uh, to see if this one makes the nice data association. If this is a current place and scan context, um, the 2D dimensional descriptor that we developed was able to discriminate in finding on the correct match of the place. Um, we tested that on the Kitty data set um, was successful. As you see, these are two same places. You see a little bit of the shift in a column wise shift that indicates the orientation difference between those two. So which means if we shift the column wise uh, and compare this descriptor, we were able to find the correct uh, the loop closure. Another thing that we found out interesting is that at the KT08 data set, there's a case when the car is on, uh, coming back in a reverse route and we were able to make the loop closure data association, association nicely. Um, so we went one more step farther. Uh, can we make this descriptor learnable? So we used this NCLT data set, long-term data set that um, was captured over a year monthly by changing day to day. And we tried, what we tried to achieve is if we only train with a one day data set. Uh, so we made a scan context out of this one day uh, data set and trained a simple CNN and to see if we can recognize and look, make a loop closure throughout the year. Um, it turned out to be fairly okay. Uh, you see, as time goes by, you see the, um, the performance drops. However, um, it's not that bad, um, especially when you think about we only train with a single day. We didn't really train after six months or three months. So after uh, this thing happened, so we uh, 
look into this data set a little further and we found out that this data set when it was capturing um, using the Segway platform, they were um, using this uh, the Segway platform and there was a human pilot who, who drive this uh, within this campus environment, which means uh, in our descriptor, because this is Asmus x-axis, you have total occlusion in certain portions. So this is this uh, yellow box indicate where uh, the data are all gone because of that occlusion. But still, we were able to make a, a new closure. So this descriptor is still have the nice and Import, informative uh, features in these other regions and was able to make the loop closure properly. And so we uh, had another test um, intentionally uh, mimicking a de demolition or construction. We get rid of 10%, 30%, or 50% of the data set um, artificially and see if our performance preserves or drops. Um, our scale context uh, drops a little bit if we remove 50% of the data, but it was not totally bad. And up to 30%, we were able to make some kind of uh, some level of the loop closure successful. Um, and our algorithm was uh, robust to the construction when we have uh, three walls. Uh, so what we did is we randomly we randomly generated the wall. On in this um, data set, making uh, artificial wall-like wall features, and when we construct three to four, three to seven walls, we were still able to make the loop closures. Um, so these uh, codes are available. This is uh, our previous uh, papers, 2008 IROS and 2019 uh, RA letter, and this is all available in the GitHub. Um, what we found during that research is we didn't have enough place recognition um, data set for the place recognition. So Kitty, there's not many point that we can evaluate our loop closure performance. Um, what, what if we had a data set that goes to the same route over and over, but for a long period of time so that we can capture the structural changes or some variances, but in the same location so that we can easily evaluate our loop closure data association performance. So that was a motivation of, of our work. And um, this is uh, this uh, will be presented this ICRA 2020 and multimodal range data, data set because we include radar and LIDAR. So radar is actually a very good sensor. You can see farther and it wasn't, uh, you see the cars moving, but we found this one is more robust to, because they can see farther. Um, so we attached radar and LIDAR on our car-like platform. And what we did is we uh, went to the same location and tried to capture the data um, going over the same route as much as possible so that we can have uh, enough evaluation uh, sets for our test. Um, so this data set has covered main, mainly two cities. Uh, this is a Daejeon, the city where my campus belongs to. And near to our campus, there's a city called Sejong. This is planned city. So this is, they are building this city, um, which means some, some portion of the city are completely built and people are living in there's an apartment and resi residential area. Some portion of the city are still under construction. Uh, and there's a big um, round uh, route where we can go over easily. And we just repeat that the same route over and over monthly throughout the year. That's how we make this data set. And throughout that year, because this is a planned city and this is under construction, you, we, we could capture some changes that happened over last one year. Um, so for target size, and we try to make the multi-session, uh, three sequences per site. And this is kind of a um, summary of what our data set includes. Um, so uh, this is kind of, there, there's the only, we only visualize three here for the visualization, but we capture the data set monthly um, throughout the year so that we can have enough, enough evaluation samples for our 
um, data, data association researches. Um, in this city, uh, the Sejong, like I said, we could, we were able to capture the slowly varying uh, city characteristic. There are many um, uh, variety you, you will find. There's bridges and some areas are totally open because this under construction. And we try to capture the urban diversity. So this is very, some, some portion is very complex and some portion is very rural-like and which means there's not many feature um, like structures and some portion has a lot of features. So you will see some variety. Um, so what we did is we now have those kind of data set for our um, data association research and this data set has a LiDAR and radar. So what we did is we uh, retried our previously developed scan context, which is the range measurement descriptor for the loop closure detection and see if this is generalizable to radar measurements. So this is actually some copy uh, directly from our previous paper, we tried exact same um, pattern in KD3 comparison and picking up the, um, the most, most promising uh, loop closure candidates out of it. So this is result. Um, the radar is in the blue uh, line where the LIDAR, because we had uh, on the platform, we had radar and LIDAR at the same time, so we could test them both. Uh, especially in Riverside case, Riverside is where there's not many structural variants. It's very, um, it's very uh, featureless region, where uh, the lidar uh, couldn't really capture the nearby features, but the radar was able to see farther, and it was reliably making the loop closure nicely. So, um, this using this, this data set, we could try several different things like this. Um, <clears throat> so before moving to the next topic. A short summary is we found the plate descriptor. This descriptor is very useful. And some of the feedback that I got back from um, company is they were building a robot that goes around the, uh, the town, the city and making the delivery robot. And they found our descriptor is very useful for the wake up, um, wake up performance. So. Uh, when the robot was charging in the corner of the city and when they in the morning when they wake up they wanted to make the global localized localization and this kind of key if they store the key descriptor the scan context throughout the entire from the entire city they could make the look closer nicely um, our scan context is extension is easy uh, because we only use the height of the building in the original version you can easily uh, incorporate intensity or semantic labels. I, I saw a paper that uh, in the Zikra 2020 who developed the intensity incorporated scan context. So I was guessing. So you could, we could have a, a multiple expansion to it. And also like we saw um, using the radar, other types of sensor is also applicable. So uh, this part I'm gonna uh, skip through a little faster because um, one of the paper that we present this uh, ICRA is the unsupervised learning of the LiDAR odometry. Um, the network looks like this, but this is the part, portion that I want to mention briefly because um, we try to make the unsupervised learning working. And one of the key things that we made it work is the ICP loss because it's a LiDAR and the field of view was important because making the field of view as much as possible while re reducing the loss was very important in making this one unsupervised learning. Um, th this is a learned trajectory totally without any model or thing. Why I'm saying this one is uh, the previous one is handcrafted. I think this is odometry only, but what if we can incorporate learning based um, data association possible? That's the message that I want to kind of address in this workshop because I'm very interested in this kind of topic, making the data association totally learnable. I, I guess some of the speakers um, yeah, uh, later will talk about this more detail. So, um, oh, too fast. So that was the um, end of my talk. And I think we need to overcome the structural changes, um, rotation translation or short-term and the long-term variance. 
And also we need to overcome the different modality like between radar and LIDAR for my example. And learning total look closer end-to-end -end fashion, would, it, would that be possible? That was my main answer that I wanna address in this workshop. I saw recent paper, RSS 2020, they tried to develop a totally end-to-end -to -end loop closing detection for the LIDAR. So I'm interested in this kind of topic. So um, I think for uh, Neighbor Labs who supported this fantastic work and Molit and NRF, and this is our group. And thank you so much. Oh, by the way, I saw the Slack. So these are the two, uh, three paper keyword. If you are interested in, you can type into the Slack to ask me more questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ayang. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have about uh, probably two minutes for questions. I, again, encourage you to, uh, you, you can raise hand now uh, by clicking on participants and then the raise hand sign and the unmute you if you want to ask questions directly from Ayang or you can type your questions in the Zoom chat by clicking on the chat symbol at the bottom of the Zoom meeting. Uh, so uh, we have, Uh, one person that uh... Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, one brief question would be: uh, You are using height for your uh, descriptor. Uh, yes. In your experience, how it would generalize for uh, environments that are more uniform in height? For example, tunnel environments or where indoor environments where you have constant height. Yeah. Um, um, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that paper that I mentioned earlier, um, I didn't really look into more detail. I want to see, I want to meet them virtually later. Uh, the paper that I mentioned, intensity scan context, because they, they I think they were targeting <clears throat> indoor environment where the height is very uniform. <clears throat> so I think um, incorporating semantic information or intensity will help to overcome the uniform or less discriminability of the height. Okay, uh, so we have a question from uh, one of the participants and they're asking, is it efficient to use radar in AGVs uh, and most of them are using LiDAR now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I also have a personal question regarding this, that if you have a, uh, like if you're envisioning a lot of vehicles using radar and LiDAR, do you also see the point that, you know, you pick up the LiDAR, radar or LiDAR from the other vehicle instead of like the right, uh, LiDAR reflection from your own sensor and then somehow get confused uh, about uh, what's the actual measurement? Mm -hmm. Uh, you mean the interference between sensors? Exactly, I, the interference. Um, I heard the, that issue a lot when the LiDAR is shooting each other, there's the interference issue. Uh, unfortunately, at, when we were testing, we, we hadn't really had a chance to test with many, many LiDAR sensors at the same time. But so I'm, I probably i am not the right person to answer that. But I know about that issue. But I try to make the generalizable um, descriptor. So. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So we are at our time limit here and just in the interest uh, of- I, uh, I saw Luca uh, uh, raise his hand, but I, I, I we can talk yeah. later the Slack uh, topic. Yeah, I, I apologize, Luca, just uh, just in order to keep, uh, keep the uh, time and uh, yep. basically I have to introduce the next speaker. So uh, mm -hmm. we have to move on. So okay. Ayan, thank you again for your great talk. Thank you. So uh, our next speaker is Zhao Wei Zhou. Uh, Zhao Wei is a research professor of computer science at Zhejiang University, China. He obtained his PhD degree from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the GRASP lab, the University of Pennsylvania in the US. His research interests include perception, understanding, and synthesis of 3D objects, humans, and scenes with applications in AR and robotics. 
He has organized many workshops and tutorials at top conferences such as CBPR, and he will be serving as an area chair of this year's CBPR 2020 and ACCG 2020. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan, and I've been following your work closely, and uh, I'm looking forward to your talk today. Please take it away. So can you can you hear? Yes, I can there hear you go. now. Yes, perfect. perfect. Oh, okay. So it works now. Yeah. yeah. So I think we so have a little bit less time. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's so, all right. so, so can you see my screen? No, uh, so you need to click on share screen. Uh, yeah, let, let me do it again. Uh, so you yes. see the screen? Yes, perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. So, okay. So thanks for inviting me and uh, also thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, very glad to be here and uh, I would like to uh, introduce some of our recent work on how to use learning-based methods to solve the correspondence problem in 3D reconstruction and pose estimation. So as we know, 3D reconstruction and pose estimation from 2D images are the most fundamental problems in computer vision. And the problem is, uh, as so the problem is given a set of different views of 3D thing, we need to reconstruct the, the 3D structure, for example, the point cloud, as well, as well as the viewpoints of those cameras. So this problem is known as stretch from motion or visual slide in robotics. And the, the basic principle to solve this problem is the well-known multi-view geometry which tells us that if we have point-to-point -point correspondences between images, then we can recover the relative pose of cameras as well as the 3D points. And given a new image, we can also solve the camera pose by the perspective endpoint algorithm if we have the 3D to 2D correspondences. So the problem seems very easy to solve, but in practice, building a very stable slang or stretch from motion system is still very hard. So what's the bottleneck? Yes, the correspondence problem or data association. That is the topic for, for this workshop. So we need to find the correspondences either between 2D images or between 2D image and the 3D model. So they are very difficult in, 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 in many situations. So in this talk, I would like to introduce some of our recent work to use deep learning to solve the correspondence problems. And the, the first work is on feature matching, that is to establish the 2D to 2D correspondences. So this is the standard pipeline for feature matching, where we first detect feature, uh, feature points, then we extract the descriptors for them, and finally we match them according to the to the descriptors. So the quality of descriptor is very important. And the most widely used descriptors, for example, SIFT, they are handcrafted geometric features and in most cases they are doing great jobs, but they don't encode semantic or contextual information. So they may fail in many cases. For example, uh, if there is poor texture, or there is very large appearance change due to various reasons like illumination change. So in some recent work, people are trying to use the confidence to, to extract the deep features as the descriptors. And we can see the basic idea is we can concatenate the feature map values that correspond to the same pixel location to form a vector and use this vector as the descriptor for this pixel. And uh, this network can be just a pre-trained neural network like VGG trained on ImageNet, or it can be fine-tuned given some annotations of 2D correspondences. And, uh, this, uh, and here is a comparison between the learned features 
and the traditional handcrafted features. And the top row actually is super point, which is a state of art methods. And the bottom row is saved. And we can see that if there is a very large illumination change, the learned features are much better. But this is not always the case. And uh, we know that SIFT can handle very large and rotation change, but typically the CNN descriptors, they are very sensitive to the scale and the rotation change as the examples show here. So the reason behind this is the convolution is not equivalent to scaling and rotation. And here the equivalence basically means that for a function f, for example, the neural network, if the input is transformed by some transformation g, then the new output should be able to be predicted by applying g to the original output. So for convolution, this is true if g is just a translation, but it is not true if g is scaling or rotation. So this is uh, what we need to solve. So how to make CNN features in equivalent to scale and rotation? An idea is data augmentation. So basically we can artificially scale and rotate the image and obtain a set of warped images. And if we, fit, if we fit all of them through the convenience, then we can obtain the features at different scales and different rotations. And then if we pull all, all, all these features, then the resulting feature or this, this descriptor will be invariant to the scale and the rotation. Seems very straightforward. But the problem is the pooling operation will lose a lot of information like across scales or rotations and make the, uh, the feature less discriminative. So in this work, our idea is instead of use, using pooling, we can treat the features as a function with respect to scale and rotation and use another neural network to further encode these features to be a final descriptor. And as we know, the set of scale and the rotation actually forms a group in mathematics. So we call this a group feature, which can be visualized like this. And then we can apply the group convolutions to further encode this feature and obtain the final descriptor. And the group convolution actually is an extension of the regular convolution from the translation group to any other group. Uh, that is scale plus rotation in this work. And it also, it, it can be shown that the transformation of the input image will result in permutation, just permutation of the group feature. And uh, also because group convolution is equivalent to, to the transformation, so the final descriptor after pooling will be invariant to the transformation in the group that is scaling and the rotation in our case. So this is the whole process. And we call it the group invariant feature transform and a gift in short. So let's see some results. And here are the qualitative comparison between gift and the super points. And the, the images in each pair uh, they are very similar to each other, but with changes in rotation, in rotation and in, in scale. And we can see that if there is large scale and rotation changes, GIFT performs much better than super points. And uh, here we show some quantitative results on the different levels of scale and the rotation change. And the green line is SIFT, the blue line is super point, and the other two lines are gift with two different detectors. And we can see if the change is relatively small, then super point and gift are very similar to each other. But if, and they are much better, they are much better than sift. But if the, the change increases, then we can see that uh, the performance of super point drops very quickly. But, but, 
gift and a sift, they are much more stable and robust to scale and rotation. And on the structural motion data sets, gift also outperforms sift and super point in terms of the relative rotation, uh, uh, relative pose estimation. And here is the rotation error. And if we look at uh, the reconstructed maps, we can see that gift gives much denser reconstruction than sift. We also uh, evaluate on the visual, uh, visual localization task where we need to register the query image to, to reconstruct the model. Uh, then we can localize the camera with PMT. And the, the, the curves show the success rates uh, on the different error thresholds. And then we can see that uh, GIFT also performs the, the best. All right, so uh, this, is, this is about uh, the feature matching between images. And uh, next, I would like to talk about a very relate, related problem that is 3D object pose estimation. So in this problem, uh, given an RGB image of a 3D object, we need to, uh, and also suppose the 3D model of this object is given, we need to recover the rotation and the translation of the 3D model. Uh, in the camera frame. And uh, this problem has many applications in robotics, uh, for example, in grasping uh, or autonomous driving. So uh, the, this problem can also be solved by the perspective endpoint algorithm. If we know some pairs of 3D, uh, some pairs of correspondences between the 3D points on the 3D model and some 2D points in the 2D image. And in traditional approaches, the correspondences are given by matching a template image with the test image using some features like sift. But as we mentioned, sift matching cannot deal with textureless objects. So, so what can we do? Of course, we can also use the learn features as before. But actually, for this problem, for object pose estimation, a better option is that we can we can define some key points on the 3D model, and then we can train a neural network to localize those key points in the image. Then we can have the 3D to 2D correspondences. This, this idea was proposed in our ICRA 2070 paper and uh, was also used in many recent state of our methods. And uh, actually most of the key point detectors uh, right now are based on the, this kind of heat map representations of key points. For example, the hourglass model. And uh, they are generally, they generally work pretty well, but still have some limitations. Yeah, the first is- drop. I just want to mention that we have about two minutes for questions. Uh, okay, okay, I will speed up. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so the first is occlusion. So look at this image, part of this cat is occluded and the, the invisible key points are difficult to localize. And another, uh, uh, and, and another challenge is the truncation where uh, the key points are even outside of the image and cannot be represented by the heat map. So the question is how to robustly localize invisible key points. For example, look at this image. How can we represent the locations of the ear of this cat, uh, which are even outside the image? So to solve this challenge, we propose a vector field representation for the key points. That is for each key point, we regress vectors that point from each pixel to the key points. So the intersection of them give us the location of these key points. And there are several advantages for this representation. First, it can represent the invisible key points even outside the image. Right? And the second is, uh, it is pixel-wise voting, so supposed to be more robust to occlusion. And finally, uh, this kind of dense voting can provide uh, a, dis a distribution of these key points instead of a single estimate. So, and this uncertainty of key points actually can be considered in the PMP algorithm where we can reweight the reprojection error by the covariance matrix and make the final pose estimation more robust. So here are, here are the results on the public benchmarks. And actually we outperformed the previous methods by a large margin. 
And uh, here are some qualitative results. And we can see even for heavy occluded objects, the result is pretty good. And there is no temporal smoothing. And uh, the algorithm is also very efficient. Here are some real-time demos on the laptop and uh, also on, on a mobile phone. All right, so the Jawi, I think we, we lost uh, your voice. I cannot hear you. And we're also almost running out of time. Okay. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but uh, I cannot hear you uh, any longer. And, and we are out of time. And I, and I need to move on to the next speaker if we want to keep the schedule on time. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any questions. Uh, uh, Jave, I really enjoyed your talk. It was very cool. Thanks. Uh, and I was hoping that we have more time to, to chat about this, but uh, it seems like we are out of time uh, and I need to move on to the next speaker. Uh, so thank you again for the great talk. Uh, if anyone has questions from Jave, I, I invite you to uh, just email him directly and ask the questions. Uh, so uh, moving on to our next speaker, we have uh, we have Florian Bernard uh, joining us. Uh, so Florian is a visiting professor at, uh, at the Chair of Computer Vision and Artificial Intelligence at the Technical University of Munich, Germany. Before that, he held the position as postdoctoral researcher at the Max Black Institute, as well as the University of Luxembourg, where he also received his PhD degree from. Uh, he has received numerous awards that I probably cannot mention all of them. Uh, he's uh, just, just to mention a few like, G, uh, like GMDS, AFR, a, AFR PhD grants, the Siemens Shape Award for the best conference paper, the BBM Award for his PhD thesis. And uh, he's also a CVPR Outstanding Reviewer. He got a CVPR Outstanding uh, Reviewer Award in 2019. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm following uh, Florian's work very closely and I'm uh, very interested in his work and his research. Uh, very excited to have him today and looking forward to hearing his talk. Florian, please take it away. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. And also see my colorful screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great honor for me to present my work in this workshop. So I decided that rather than giving a broad talk, I want to talk about a particular recent piece of work on higher order projected power iterations for scalable multi-matching. And uh, I decided to do so since I think this will nicely complement many of the other talks. So the overall problem uh, setting that we are considering is that we are given some objects like these images of cats and we also assume that we have unmatched points in these objects and then we are looking at the correspondence problem where we want to determine a point-to-point -point correspondence. And I think GOY has already done a very good job in motivating the correspondence problem in his previous talk so I would not um, say anything more about this, this part. Let me instead give you a brief and a very simplified taxonomy of correspondence problems. So of course, it's not possible that I cover the vast area of correspondence problems in a single slide. So please bear with me if I miss some works here. Probably the most simple setting is when you have point features only. And in this case, so we assume we have some points and at each of these points, we have some feature descriptors, and then we want to use these feature descriptors in order to obtain the point-to-point -point matching. Mathematically, this can be tackled using a linear assignment problem, which is most commonly solved by the Hungarian algorithm, or it can also be solved by the auction algorithm, which in practice we have found that it's much faster. And, and the nice thing about these settings is that using these algorithms, we can find a global optimum in polynomial time. 
Now, a bit more complex setting is when we also want to take into account geometric consistency. So in this case, we also want to take into account pairwise distances between points. And when we do this, then, then we can essentially achieve this geometric consistency that I mentioned. And again, mathematically, this can be phrased as a quadratic assignment problem, which is also oftentimes uh, referred to as graph matching. The issue here now is that this problem is in general NP-hard. So either we need to, we can only find a global optimum using some, uh, for some very small problems, for example, based on function bound algorithms, or we need to, uh, need to essentially accept that we cannot find global optima for arbitrarily large problems. So far, we've looked at the case of matching two objects. Um, what I want to focus on in this talk is when we have, have a collection of objects, so we want to look at the case of k larger than two. And now, if we want to match point features only, I would like to call this a multi-linear assignment problem, or in literature, also some, uh, some of these cases are known as permutation synchronization. And although it's, it had, has been proven that permutation synchronization is an NP-hard problem, um, I think in general, I, one can tell that these problems are scalable in practice. So what I mean by that, I particularly put this in quotes, is that for a given problem, one can usually find local optima that are good enough, and one can even do so for very large problem instances. Now, when we also want to account for geometric consistency in a multi-matching setting, then these problems are known as multi-graph matching. And in contrast to the multi-LIP problems for multi-graph matchings in general, so they're also NP-hard, but in general, they're not scalable, not even scalable in practice. And although I'm interested in all these four, four areas, today in this talk, I want to talk about this setting of uh, having a collection of objects with geometric consistency. So let me next briefly motivate the importance of geometric consistency. So what you can see here on the left is a multi-matching on the um, Tosca da shape data set for this uh, Centaur shape instance, where we essentially use the method I'm going to talk about today to obtain a geometrically consistent multi-matching. And you can see that essentially the correspondence look light, nice and smooth, and at least visually they look correct. In contrast, we've also um, evaluated the same data set with a method that does not take geometric consistency into account, there we get some mis mismatches. For example, here we have the purple point on the back of the sand tower, although purple should belong somewhere to, in the upper body region. Or here in this area, we have one of these green, uh, green correspondence points that should also belong to the back of the, of the horse, of the sand tower. And previous works that consider geometric consistency are generally not scalable to multi-matching problems with many points, or they handle only special cases of geometric consistency. For example, for, for the case of having 2D image coordinates. And in this talk, we want, I want to um, explain a method that fills, the, fills this gap by proposing a scalable method that considers a generic geometric consistency formulation. In order to do so, I want to briefly introduce the concept of cycle consistency. And Cycle consistency means when we talk about matchings that if we want to, if we match one point of this blue cat to another point of the red cat, and we also match the same point of the blue cat to the green cat, then if the matching is cycle consistent, then we also need to match this point from the green cat to the red cat. In contrast, on the right hand side, you can see a multi matching that is not cycle consistent. Because when, you, when we start here and we follow the cycle, we end up here, which is clearly a different point than where we started at. And one important notion of um, cycle consistency or one way how to, rep how to model cycle consistency is based on object to universe matchings. The idea here is that for all the individual objects, we use partial permutation matrices that represent object to universe matchings. This simply means that instead of using pairwise matchings, we assume that there exists a universe that contains all unique points, and then we match all points of each object to a subset of these universe points. And with that, if we now define pairwise matchings xij as matching from i to the universe and then matching back from the universe to j, then cycle consistency is guaranteed by construction. So for example, the matching from one to one to three in this case would be we first go from here to here, and then we match from here to here, and then we would get a pairwise matching between one and three. 
And if we do this for all pairs of shapes uh, from, from uh, uh, x1 to xk, of, for all k shapes, uh, shapes essentially, then we get pairwise matchings that are cycle consistent. And now what we do is we use this um, object universe formulation to phrase an optimization problem for solving multi-matching with geometric consistency. And the overall idea is that we have k objects and between, between each pair of objects i and j, we solve a quadratic assignment problem. And in the quadratic assignment problem, we essentially want to maximize the inner product between two things. This term here, which is AI. And AI is simply the adjacency matrix of the graph of these nodes that essentially encode the pairwise distances between all pairs of nodes. And so this is one term. And the other term that we also have is we have the adjacency matrix of the J's object. And what we simply do is we use the matching from I, I to J and we reorder the rows and columns of this AJ in such a way that it's uh, in correspondence with AI. And then we want to uh, maximize this thing with respect to the pairwise matchings. So that's the, the overall idea uh, what we do. But instead of now introducing hard cycle consistency constraints, we simply say, OK, we use this definition based on the object to universe matchings. And we plug this in so that we obtain an object to universe quadratic assignment problem. So again, I put this QAP here in quotes because the objective function is clearly not quadratic anymore, but now it's a fourth order polynomial. And what is, what is happening here is essentially that we reorder rows and columns of AI here, as well as reordering rows and columns of AJ here. And then we want to maximize the inner product between both. And we do, do this for all k-square pairs of IJ. And the optimization variables here are the variables x1 to xk. So the object universe matchings where we ask that each of these xi is a partial permutation matrix. And next, I want to introduce a matrix notation that will make things a bit more compact. And for this, I define the matrix A, which on its diagonal contains the adjacency matrix 1 to, uh, to ak. And with that, we can write this problem here in this matrix form. So we want to maximize over U, where U is a matrix that comprises the blocks X1 to XK. And this U is in a set curly U, which simply says that each of these blocks XI1 to XK must be a partial permutation matrix. And what we want to maximize is the inner product between U transpose a U and U transpose a U. And essentially one can show that this is equivalent to this. And the only thing that why I do this is because the notation of this is a bit more compact and I will use this from now on. And in order to maximize this problem, we propose a higher order projected power iteration algorithm or HIPI in short. So again, for your convenience, you can see here the problem. And next I want to show you the HIPI algorithm. So don't be afraid, it will be a very easy algorithm. So the main idea is that we repeat two steps until convergence. The first step is a power iteration step for this fourth order polynomial term. And what is happening here is simply we define a matrix V, which is set to something that is proportional to the gradient of the objective function. Then subsequently, we take this V and we just project it onto the set of the, of, onto the set curly U. And this can be easily shown that this simply amounts to solving K independent linear assignment problems. Now you may actually wonder if this makes sense and if that actually maximizes this objective. And this is actually true because um, in our work, we have shown that this algorithm conver converges to, uh, to, to some local optimum. So essentially, we can show that in each step of this power iteration, these objective functions is monotonically increasing. And since this set, U, uh, this set curly u is a discrete set, this also means that the, the HIPI algorithm converges in a finite number of iterations. Now let's look at uh, some results. So here you can see the F-score for different methods where the F-score is a combination of the precision and recall. And we compare against several other methods that do not take into account geometric consistency because our method is the only one that we found that scales to such large problems, problems while also considering geometric consistency. And in this setting, we believe that having geometric consistency clearly improves the overall performance, which you can see here by this significant gap. Moreover, as I mentioned, by construction, our method guarantees cycle consistency, which is not the case for all the other methods. Moreover, in terms of runtime, 
our method is comparable to those methods that don't take into account geometric consistency. And let us also look at some qualitative results for shape matching. So this is now the cat instance from the Tosca data set. In the first row, you can see the method by Cosmo and, uh, and colleagues, which considers geometric consistency, but produces only very few matchings, so that there are large regions in the shapes without any matchings. In the second row, you can see the method by Tron et al, which does not take into account geometric consistency and therefore leads to mismatches. See, for example, this area here or this area here. In contrast, on the one hand, our method achieves a large number of multi-matchings. And on the other hand, these matchings are reliable due to the, uh, due to the incorporation of geometric uh, information. We also evaluate this method on the Willow data set where we compared uh, methods without geometric consistency to methods with geometric consistency. And in overall, in terms of the F-score, we can see that uh, our method outperforms the other methods, while at the same time being the fastest method among those that take into account geometric consistency. Here you can also see some qualitative results for different cases of the Willow data set, like for the duck or the car, the faces or the motorbikes. And in overall, you can see that in general, the correspondents look good, but they're not always perfect. I mean, this is, al is also already indicated by the fact that this F-score is not one in all cases. For example, here for the duck, you see that this point should actually belong to the back part of the neck, but here it's actually the front part. So there are still some, some slight errors, but they also happen, of course, in the other method. So let me summarize what I explained to you today. So the hippie algorithm jointly optimizes for multi-matching while being scalable to very large problems. Hippie is guaranteed to produce cycle consistent multi-matchings while at the same time considering geometric consistency. Moreover, Hippie comes with convergence guarantees and as you, as you have seen, it can be implemented in basically two lines of codes. So it's extremely simple. And eventually, I've shown that Hippie achieves state-of-the-art results on various challenging problems. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take some questions from you. Thank you. Thanks, Florian. This fantastic talk. Uh, so uh, we now invite the participants to ask questions. You can type your question in in the Zoom chat uh, by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, or you can uh, click on participants and then on the bottom corner of the panel that opens, click on uh, raise hand and then we unmute you and you can ask questions directly from Florian. So Florian, maybe uh, while we're waiting for uh, questions to come in, I have, a, I have a question that I uh, want to see like, where you're seeing these techniques going in the next, uh, say, five years. Right. Um, so I think that they're essentially like, in particular, regarding multi-matching with geometric consistency, I think there are like two main, uh, main directions. Like one is further improving runtime. I mean, you've seen like on, on my runtime uh, plots, there are still like, for example, the quick match method by Roberto for the method without geometric consistency is much faster than everything else we've seen before. And I hope that this can also happen for methods with geometric consistency at some point so that we, we like again gain like one ma more magnitude of order in terms of runtime um, improvement. And of course the other direction is um, also I think there are already some works that, that go in this direction is like um, using learning to essentially extract the right features to, to perform multi-matching. I think like these are two complementary things and uh, I think they should go ha hand in hand and they will eventually, in my opinion, boost the performance of multi-matching methods. Interesting. Yeah, I, I agree that yeah, the, the runtime is uh, very important, in particular if you want to use this in, in a real world robotic system and you want it to run mm -hmm. uh, in real life. I think Roberto has a question and I think uh, we'll go to Roberto to ask his questions and uh, we'll move there's on a, to the next speaker. There's a question in chat as well. Yeah. So, um, great, very interesting work. Uh, my question was, um, it seems that your method could be applied also for even higher geometric relations. I'm thinking about like the, if people are constrained, 
gives you relation between uh, five points at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, so do you think you could extend your method to the like higher, uh, higher order, even higher order um, uh, geometric relations? So I've not thought about this, um, this particular setting of using AP polar constraints, but in general, like there's a certain structure of uh, higher order objective functions that our method can straightforwardly handle. And um, I would have to, to like uh, think about this if the, for example, AP polar constraints would work. But in general, I mean, it's not only fourth order polynomials that you can optimize for. There also are like other higher order, even higher order formulations that you can, can uh, handle with the method essentially. Uh, thanks, Florian. Um, so we have two questions that I don't think that we have time to answer, but uh, two questions we're asking, is this running in real time? Uh, I believe the answer is no, right? Well, I mean, it depends on the number of points you're matching. If you just match like few points, then um, you can, of course, also get real-time performance, but um, not for the very large scale problems, of course, yeah. And then there's a qu quick question about, does this work for non-rigid objects? Um, you don't have I mean, geometric consistency there. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, th there's like some assumption that there is, uh, I mean, the objects cannot arbitrarily deform because then it doesn't make sense anymore to, to like ensure that the pairwise distances between points uh, are matched. But I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's um, developed for deformable objects within some bonds, of course. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks again for the fantastic talk, uh, Florian. Uh, so we, Thank you. We are uh, now going to move on to the last speaker of the session. So this is a joint uh, talk by Caesar and Juan. I think Caesar is doing the uh, job of presenting here. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce Caesar quickly. Caesar is a senior researcher with the Autonomous Systems Lab at ETH Zurich in Switzerland and director of the uh, education within the ETH Robotics X initiative. He obtained his PhD in computer science and systems engineering from the University of Zaragoza in Spain. He has been senior researcher at University of Adelaide and uh, the Australian Center for Robotics Vision and held a postdoctoral position at George Mason University in US. His research interests include robotic perception and learning for navigation and mapping. Caesar, we are uh, very happy to have you today and uh, look forward to, to your talk. Please take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, how do you hear me first? Uh, I'm hearing you very well. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I, uh, I want to share my screen, but I think you have to stop. Uh, you can override my share screen. Okay. Okay. Good. Then uh, first I apologize because uh, I cannot share my camera. I am in two devices for sharing the screen and sharing um, my sound, technical programs. I apologize for that. Then I will, uh, I want to start uh, to continue, uh, given that I don't have a camera. This is me, I'm Cesar Cadena. As Kavet uh, uh, mentioned, I am with the Autonomous Systems Lab. And in the Autonomous Systems Lab, uh, uh, we work with a big number of, great number of students that uh, is led by Professor uh, Roland Seguard and my colleague Juan Nieto. The first thing that I want to do in this talk is to really acknowledge the work of the students that made it possible. Uh, this work uh, has been all the realizations of these great students uh, with their bright minds and the great collaboration that we have had over the years. Then uh, another thing that I want to do now is to acknowledge and thanks uh, the previous speakers because they have set up all the all the background that it would be necessary uh, for the problem. Uh, then uh, let me just recapitulate a little bit. I will talk about the data association problem and I will use the localization use case here for this. Um, as we know, then we can have a, a map uh, and a map of the environment that can be built. Uh, can have been built before, or maybe is uh, on the way. Is uh, we are building an on the fly, right? Then uh, our task is to have a current sensing and localize that sensing, that uh, information piece of information in this map that we are um, uh, navigating. 
And then where are we is the problem that we will have to solve. And uh, maybe that map is built uh, from another robot or another trajectory than uh, the one that we are having right now. Probably, maybe, I don't know, maybe opposite directions, which make uh, a little bit difficult to localize, uh, even when there is the same place. But even more challenging is maybe the map is, has been built by uh, maybe a drone, a real robot, with a completely a very drastic change in uh, point of view, which make uh, this uh, localization a little bit harder. This is not, point of view is not the only challenge. Of course, we can have uh, the, the, the challenge of the changes in the environment that actually we, as humans, introduce. For example, in the ladies street market in Hong Kong from 9 a.m. to 6 a.m. or not just by our changes, but the changes of daylight or uh, the weather conditions. Uh, in summary, it's very challenging. What we want to do then is uh, to solve this problem, right? Then uh, a possible uh, pipeline, uh, very, um, uh, very <laughs> attractive for most of the students, especially bachelor or master students, uh, when they first approach this problem is to use a kind of hammer. Then they try to say, okay, I can take my input and regress my location, and that's it. We are not going to do this in this talk. Uh, maybe in the future, somebody is going to have a very nice answer here, but uh, we, we will not do it now. Um, then uh, I will continue by saying there's another possible pipeline. We will have a sensor input, we will have a representation, uh, a structured representation, then perform the data association with the map that we have been building, or we are building on the fly, and then we leave that, those associations to an estimation to regress uh, a location in this map. Right, uh, this is uh, what we are going to talk today, uh, the representation and data association, the combination of both. Um, if we start by that pipeline, a uh, classic one would say is something like we take a sensory input, an image in this case, and extract sparse features, right? Maybe you have some descriptors, zip, sort, any other. And uh, probably in the data association side, we will have a backwards uh, uh, representation to retrieve some of the features from the map. From these local features, then we will uh, find maybe a nearest neighbor, then leave these uh, nearest neighbor uh, correspondences to the estimation uh, that is possible, uh, possible a ransack uh, algorithm or to fit a model uh, to the reject of layers or not and have our pose. Then uh, the first, before continuing, I want to just iterate on what I want to transmit today and is the high level understanding uh, will help us to solve the data association problem. And specifically, I will talk about the context, the understanding of context, and later the understanding of the semantics. For the uh, first thing is in the, this pipeline, let me try to just upgrade the pipeline from this classical one to something that uh, leverage the advances in machine learning. In the advances, um, I was, uh, uh, we can just take uh, a network that maybe uh, extract the local features. Uh, in this case, uh, something about uh, super points, uh, this still it super points to be more efficient. And uh, it also takes a global descriptor out of the same network, just for computational purposes. Then when we have that, the global descriptor can go to our database, retrieve a set of a place, and in that way, in that local area, we can then match a little bit uh, the local features, and then again, send it to Ransack to uh, retrieve the right location, the right, right transformation. Right, this uh, pipeline was the winner of the last year uh, challenge in visual localization in the visual localization workshop. CVPR 19. Some of the examples of the success of this uh, network, of this pipeline, are uh, uh, shown here. Uh, as you can see, uh, is able to 
solve uh, quite some changes in, in, in illumination day to night. It's also very robust to kind of the white baseline. And these are uh, some glare in the, in the camera. It's actually doing a pretty good job, right? Now, um, what we can do uh, is uh, to see also the failure cases, right? And the failure cases, we have some failure cases that are given because of the mismatch of the global picture, the global descriptor. And uh, there are other that are more local. Um, these local uh, uh, errors, if you see here, is the same place, but the local descriptors were not able to match. It was too much to ask to this descriptor, right? Then uh, let's focus first in these uh, local descriptors and in these uh, local uh, matching errors uh, by uh, attacking the local data association problem, where we are going then to uh, use what we have as an input, in this case, the local feature, the super points, and uh, change the local matching. The first thing that we will want to do is to pay a little bit more attention of the set of features, not just feature by feature independently. Then we will take the features and descriptors, the descriptor and location of those uh, uh, sparse features, and uh, encode them in a graph neural network. This graph neural network will associate all the features inside one image, A, and inside the image B, B within them, and also will associate all those set of features between images, right? Uh, it's a big graph, but uh, we will use that and in, a, in a neural network fashion and then compute some scores to uh, have a, a matching uh, at the end, especially a differentiable matching. Uh, this uh, has been uh, coined as a super clue method and it's going to be presented in two weeks in CVPR 2020. Let's go a little bit more in detail how we are doing this. The first thing, we have the descriptors in uh, the image A with the locations, B. Uh, same happen in the image B that we want to match. And uh, first, we will encode the position in a key point encoder to uh, augment or uh, um, enrich the visual descriptor. Once that is done, uh, we go for the attention uh, mechanism in the graph neural network where as I mentioned before, we have two graphs. One graph uh, will take care, or one attention in the graph will take care of the self-attention within the image, each of the images. And the second one will have uh, to take care about the attention between one particular feature against all features in the other image, right? And that is done for all at the same, all the features at the same time. Uh, this process is iterated, first, uh, first self-attention, then cross-attention, and we repeat this in L uh, uh, steps, L layers of this. Once we have finished with the attention, uh, we go for a, a, the score or the, 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 the feature that we get at the end for every one, each one of these nodes, uh, we'll get uh, in a dot product to have a score matrix. This part is the differentiable assignment problem where we augment this score matrix by a dot spin for possible features that are, shouldn't be matched and uh, apply then an approximation to the gradient algorithm with the single uh, algorithm by normalizing uh, the rows iteratively, then uh, normalize the columns in T steps. Once that is done, we just uh, take the maximum uh, on this um, in this matrix to get uh, to get the right assignment, right? Then uh, let's see what 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 is the result of this. Um, these are some examples, some very curious examples. The first one uh, is a very repetitive pattern, as we can see. On the right, we see how superpoint plus superglue is able to retrieve a, a great amount of matches and the right matches. On all the left side, uh, we can see that the super point by the standard uh, nearest neighbor and probably a threshold in the match in the distances give us some matches and uh, can be very confusing because 
here the outliers are the majority and these outliers are a structure then this will fool any uh, robust estimator because the majority is given a transformation a valid one uh, but it's a wrong one right uh, then we can use also a um, machine that has been learned like uh, the oa net uh, with the super points where again we have the majority of the the matches are wrong and they are uh, consistent between them but they are the wrong one then um, as we can see a super glue by using the content is in the whole image is able uh, to retrieve the right matches from the super point descriptors we see this example in in different data sets in different uh, environments like for example as well the uh, outdoors and uh, at, at least up to uh, 10 minutes ago we are still the first uh, in the local features challenge and also the first in the table for of the visual localization for handheld devices challenge in this year's uh, CBPR workshop on visual localization. We'll see in two weeks if uh, this uh, super glue has won the challenges or not. But let's try to have a little bit more of a uh, uh, intuition on what happens inside. As the, the first one is the self attention. If you see what happened in the self attention is that one feature, if it is not discriminated enough, tries to anchor uh, the, uh, the, 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 its discriminated, its descriptor to uh, more discriminative ones, like here uh, to the walls or uh, something that is in a window to the corners of the building, right? And in the cross attention, what happened is that with the layers, the, the feature start to attend more and more to the possible uh, correspondence, the most likely correspondence. Right, I will try to speed up here. And then uh, as a summary of here, the messages, the context understanding with this graph matching with neural networks allow us for this ambiguity uh, and the heavy perceptualizing. And also give us, uh, uh, try to favor group consistency given the priors of the point locations. Uh, but what about the wrong, uh, the global data association? Uh, then uh, for that, if we see the examples here, it would be very easy to say that they are wrong if we have a little bit of knowledge in the semantic side. Then in the semantic side, what we are going to do is to say, look, semantic segmentation has been advanced so much. Why don't we exploit that, right? Then if we exploit that, what we can do is to build in a frame a kind of a graph that uh, uh, interconnect these instant semantic instances and then uh, with we are moving we increase the size of this graph this uh, allow us for more discriminative power and at the end what we will have uh, is uh, this small graph that we can uh, maybe uh, uh, describe by some kind of a uh, uh, technique in this case we chose a random walk around the node that uh, is representative for this uh, subgraph um, and then uh, in this random walk, it, what, what we are encoding is the neighbors what is the class of the neighbors of that node and try to match it to a bigger graph that is representing the map that has been built in the similar way once we do that in this map inside we are showing here the 3d just for, for uh, visualization but what we build this uh, graph, semantic graph uh, for the mapping, then uh, the localization is just querying and matching these very quick uh, uh, descriptors uh, against the map. These uh, allow us to have uh, even matches between a frontal view uh, of a robot against a map that was built from an aerial view and is outperforming any other technique of learning or the classical uh, way of doing it. Um, then uh, what we show in this uh, work is that the semantic understanding of the world naturally provides us uh, with invariances to illumination and drastic viewpoint changes because semantics are inherently invariant to them, right? Uh, of course, uh, because they are invariant, they are also, if we progress enough in the semantic segmentation side, they are suitable for heterogeneous sensor modalities. 
any sensor modality that you can extract semantics, they are going to be able to match in this abstraction, abstraction layer. Uh, there are, of course, problems. And uh, given that those are not perfect yet, uh, we will have always some kind of aliasing and noisy semantics that could create issues. And then uh, we propose some multi-hypothesis uh, tracking for that. I will go very quick over there uh, because uh, for the sake of time, but so, this uh, is an example to, of the- Sorry to interrupt. So we have, we are almost out of time. Uh, yeah. We have less yeah, yeah. Than it's, two, it's one slide. <laughs> then uh, the noise that we have here, then what we do is the same example that we have before, but what the difference is that in every uh, local node on every local map, what we have is a, a multi-hypothesis tree to match uh, our uh, subgraph. With that, we show that uh, we have a much better improvement uh, just uh, by having multiple hypotheses uh, for the loop closer problem of the localization problem. Okay, then the final conclusion is this multi-hypothesis semantic mapping will provide us with this uh, uh, robustness that we will need to the noisy and ambiguous semantic inputs. And with that, I want to thank you. And then uh, I'm happy to answer one question of two, if it's possible. Okay, thanks again, Cesar. So I think you and Jave had a very great presentation and many works simply that uh, it was kind of uh, impossible to fit in, uh, in, in a 15 minute talk, uh, but understandably very exciting and I'm really glad that you talked about it. I'm also very excited about the, uh, about the results for your CVPR 2020. Uh, if we have a question, uh, perhaps a very quick, quick question we can, we can ask, uh, uh, feel free to raise hands and we unmute you. You can ask your question or just type your question in the Zoom chat box. Uh, we are going to uh, a break, so uh, you can uh, type the questions there and uh, I think Caesar can reply back to you uh, while we're at the break. Any questions? So I have a question, Cesar. So did you? Uh, I'm not sure. I might have missed this, but did you mention anything about the runtime of your uh, CVPR feature matching uh, technique? No, I didn't. I didn't mention it, but uh, it runs at. Of course, this uh, requires G, uh, GPU uh, because of the learning side and uh, runs at uh, for a thousand key points at 15 frames per second. That is not an issue, actually. 15 frames per second. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Okay, well, uh, thanks again uh, for your great talk. Uh, again, we are open to asking questions in the Zoom chat box. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go back to the schedule again. So uh, uh, want to thank all the speakers in this session uh, for the great talks. Uh, we are going to a coffee break now. It's a 25 minute coffee break. We come back here at 1025 uh, and uh, start with our second session. The second session will be chaired by Roberto and uh, I guess we'll, we'll see you shortly. Thank you. So I think uh, we can go ahead and uh, get it started uh, by just going over the going over some of the logistics of the meeting uh, today again. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I just want to remind you again how you can interact with our speakers today. So there are two methods. Uh, the first method I, I want to again emphasize that we have muted all the participants just to make sure there are no uh, interruptions and uh, you can ask questions by uh, in, the, in the first method by clicking on this participant icon at, at the bottom of your screen and then the panels open up and then you click on raise hand a session chair will see that you raise hand this indicates that you want to ask a question verbally they unmute you and then you ask your question uh, in the second method, you can simply type your questions in in the chat box. So just click on the chat icon in the bottom and then the panel opens up and then type the question there. The question will be visible to everyone. Uh, so uh, we're going to start session two in about two minutes. And uh, again, I want to emphasize that we have four themes on mathematical model, algorithmic methods, 
uh, learned models and end-to-end -end methods, applications in robotics, computer vision, and intersectional learning and algorithmic methods. And the talks uh, in this session are going to be a mix of that. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Roberto now uh, to uh, basically start the second session, session, and Roberto will be chairing this session. Roberto. Yes. Thank you, Kaveh. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the first spotlight. Uh, the spotlight uh, is based on um, papers that were submitted to the workshop and they were deemed uh, to be novel and uh, interesting and uh, pertaining to the workshop. And um, so the first, uh, the papers can be found on the website if you want to follow along. Uh, the first uh, talk is by Daniele Cattaneo, and uh, it's a work, joint work with Domenico Sorrenti and Abina Valada. Uh, Daniele is uh, at the in the Department of Computer Science at the University of uh, Freiburg in Germany, and uh, in the Dipartimento di Informatica, Sistemi e Comunicazione, Università di Milano, um, Bicocca in uh, Italy. Uh, the topic of the um, uh, paper and uh, of the talk, it's how to combine um, learning, specifically convolutional uh, neural networks, with traditional uh, geometric uh, computer vision uh, for localization in large maps. And with this, Daniele, your, the floor is yours. Jim? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Let me share my screen. How can I share the live yep. show? We see your screen. Okay, um, you see the presentation or the PowerPoint? We see the presentation. Okay. So, hello everyone. I'm Daniele Cattaneo from the University oh, of Rome. Sorry, sorry now, sorry now we see. Okay, okay, it's good. Great. Okay, so I'm Daniele Cattaneo from the University of Freiburg, and today I'm going to present our work, CMRNet Plus Plus map and camera agnostic monocular visual localization in LiDAR map. Um, any autonomous mobile systems and especially self-driving cars require an accurate localization in order to safely navigate the environment. Uh, while global navigation satellite systems such as the GPS provide a localization at global scale where accuracy and reliability is not adequate for safe navigation, um, for example, in urban environments or indoor environments, the satellite signal is poor or, the, or is not available at all, and therefore a complementary approaches are required to safely navigate the environment. In this paper, we propose an approach for robot localization that perform a local localization, and therefore we need an initial route position, position estimate to be known in advance. And we expect such estimate to have an accuracy of 3.5 meters and 20 degrees. In order to get such an initial estimate, uh, one way is to use the GPS when it's available. Another way is to use, um, like for example, we proposed an approach for global visual localization in LiDAR maps in this ICRA. So if you're interested, you can check it out. In the last decade, um, maps provider are developing the next generation IC definition map that will provide um, a 3D reconstruction of the environment in the form of point clouds. And typically, you know, the approaches that localize in such LiDAR maps usually require a LiDAR on board the vehicle. Um, however, LiDAR are expensive devices and therefore, in this paper, we propose an, an alternative way to localize in LiDAR map that require only a cheaper camera-based sensor setup on board. So uh, the input of our approach uh, are a LiDAR map of the environment, the camera from the onboard, 
a camera image from the from board the vehicle and the rough position estimates. Uh, I would like to note that um, in order to be as general as possible, it's a LiDAR map with only geometric information and without any color or intensity information. In order to, uh, now I will try to explain the reasoning behind our approach. So we have the LiDAR map, we have the ground position where the image is taken, and we have the nickel pose uh, in input. And what we want to estimate is the transformation between these two point of view. The idea is that we can generate a synthesized depth image by projecting the LiDAR map into a virtual image plane placed in the initial position. This is how this the synthesized depth image looks like, where blue pixels represent points close to the observer and red point pixels represent points far away. And if you, if you try to visually compare these two points of view, they are, of course, not aligned. Here we have other two examples from two different initial positions. Well, if you try instead to pro compare the image with the map projected in the ground position, they are well aligned. So using this insight, we, um, we pro previously proposed an approach called CMRNet that takes in input the camera image and the this map projection and estimate the six degree of freedom transformation that can be applied to the initial position in order to find an accurate localization. CMRNet was the first CNN-based approach for post-regression that does, does not learn the map, but instead it learns how to match the image with the map. And therefore CMRNet can be used in any environment for which a LiDAR map is available without any retraining. Uh, however, since the output of the network was metric, the network's weights are tied with the specific camera sensor used to collect the data for, in the training set. In order to overcome such issue, um, in this paper we propose um, a new method that combines deep learning models with geometric techniques and by moving any metric reasoning outside of the learning projects, process. In particular, we uh, extend CMRNet by decoupling the localization into two steps, a pixel to 3D point matching step followed by a geometric post regression step. In the first step, the networks only reason in pixel, in a pixel basis, basis, so the network is independent of the camera and 3C parameters. Those parameters are instead using the second steps where uh, standard computer vision technique uh, estimate the pose given the matches predicted by the network. To train the network, we have the image and the LiDAR projection and a mask of, of LiDAR point that have a matching pixel in the image. We fed the image and the LiDAR projection to the network that predicts uh, pixel displacement, displacements. And of course, we have the ground truth position and we can est uh, estimate the ground through displacements, and we train this, the network with a uh, regression loss between the predicted and the ground through displacements. And moreover, we also used a smooth loss that enforced the displacement, displacement of a pixel to be similar to the displacements of neighboring pixel. Once the network has been trained, we can apply the displacement predicted by the network to the input LiDAR image in order to find pixel to predict point correspondences. Uh, this is how the this matching looks like. We have some points, for example, the one the pole on the on the on the right that is are well aligned, and other points that are not that is aligned. In the second step, we have a set of 3D points that the map, and a set of matching pixel points. Um, in this way, and of course, we have the camera metrics. Increasing camera metrics. Uh, with this free um, input, we can estimate the position of the camera using EPNP algorithm in which in a RANSAC scheme. In order to find the position of the camera with respect to the map. 
Moreover, in order to further refine the position estimate, we train three instances of FIMRNet++, uh, one uh, specialized for large displacement, one specialized for medium displacements, and one specialized for small displacements. So again, given the RGB and the ladder projection, we fed them to the network trained with the largest displacement, and we estimate the pose. And then from this pose, we generate a new ladder image, then we fed it together with the RGB image to the second network, and so on, iteratively reducing the error of the estimation. And this is how the this is the maps projected in the position estimate after the third iteration. And as you can see, the poles are well aligned and the pose is accurate. We evaluated our approach on three autonomous vehicle data sets. The kit sorry, data set is Daniele, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think we are seeing like a black um, square on your presentation in the upper right. It looks like uh, the, it's the zoom. the zoom. Yes. Uh, I'll... Okay. If now you can better? move it. Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, we evaluated our approach on three autonomous vehicle data set, the KIT-T, the Argoverse, and the LIFT level file data sets. It spans different countries like Germany and the US, different camera resolution, and different camera and LiDAR sensors. We train our network on combination of KIT-T and Argoverse, and we always tested our network in the following test in places that were never seen during the training phase. And the list level five dataset was not included in the training. And we test CMNS plus plus trained on Kit and Argoverse on the list five without any retraining or fire tuning in order to assess its generalization capability to different city, different sensors, and different cameras. Let's see some qualitative results. Uh, here on the top left, we have the image. Uh, overlaid with the maps projected in the input position. On the top right, we have the image uh, overlaid with the maps projected in the ground truth position. And on the bottom, we have the image uh, overlaid with the maps projected in the position estimated by our approach. To um, our approach, was able to localize in the kitted data set with 14 centimeters, um, with a median of 14 centimeters and 0 0.43 degrees. We compared our approach with state of with our previous, with the previous work and other state of the art approach, and we were able to outperform them. Here we have some qualitative results on the Argoverse data set. And again, uh, we achieved 25 centimeters and 0 0.45 um, degrees. And finally, we have the result on the lift level file data sets. And I will again want to point out that the weights of the network were always the same in all three tests. So the network was trained on Kitting and Darkoverse. And on all the tests, it was the same weights. We, we didn't retrain or fine tune. And the lift level file was, uh, was, was not in the training set. In the ER, we were able to achieve 70 centimeters and 1.18 degree. To conclude, in this paper, we propose uh, an approach that synergetic combined learned method and mathematical models. And our approach was able to generalize without any retraining or fine tuning to unseen environment and different sensor, and was able to outperform state of the art approaches on the three data sets. And thank you for your attention. Uh, we also have a website with some demo and videos, and if you're interested, you can check it out. Okay. Thank you, Daniele. Uh, while uh, if anybody has questions and to type in the chat. Uh, I have a question. Um, in your experience, when you have um, like outliers, uh, meaning things that you don't, don't match with your maps, so for instance, pedestrians, other cars, 
what does the network, the neural network do for those pixels? Yeah, okay. Um, there's uh, uh, now some cases where the um, approach can fail. Like if uh, the outlier are more than a layer, then Ryansack cannot estimate a good position. So there are some cases in which our approach is not able to localize. Um, maybe, I yes. oh, uh, with images and with images, uh, with um, dynam dynamic objects like cars or pedestrians, the network try to match them with with the points that are not, like um, uh, that are behind. For example, if you have a car, the network try to match the pixel on the car with the road, not with the um, not with the car. But of course, these sometimes fail. And so, like in the future, we want to use um, semantic segmentation or panopto segmentation in order to match only static object of the scene. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, in the interest of time, um, I'll uh, invite, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Roy uh, with the next uh, presentation. So Nick Roy, he's a professor of aeronautics and astronautics uh, at MIT. Uh, he's um, director of the Robust Robotics Group and a uh, um, member of the uh, CCL group at MIT. And um, Nick does very interesting work uh, that uh, combines from uh, uh, very interesting uh, ideas about per, uh, handling perception and uh, uncertainty. So for instance, like unconventional sensors like uh, neural, um, natural language, uh, how to combine those uh, into classical path planning and uh, control techniques in robotics, but also then go all the way and uh, implement them on uh, real quadrotors and perform cool missions. So I'm very looking forward to your talk. Uh, Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Roberto. It's great, great to be here. Great to see so many people on uh, early Sunday morning. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, data association, but a different kind of data association than what we often think of as as the core problem. Um, I think it was Takeo Kanade who once said that the top three problems in uh, robotics are uh, correspondence, correspondence, and correspondence. And it is true that these problems show up, you know, in all kinds of places that we don't expect. Um, so, uh, what do I mean by that? Let me begin by let me begin by getting PowerPoint to work. There we go. Um, so let me begin by talking about what we normally think of as the standard architecture for most of our vehicles and systems. So we're all and, and this this uh, uh, first part of the talk is something that you know I've been talking about for a couple of years now. Um, and so uh, some of you may have seen uh, my talking about this in the context of planning, um, but it also shows up in the context of perception. So we have a very standard base level of autonomy that exists in pretty much every single autonomous vehicle or even semi-autonomous vehicle on the planet. Um, and this is something that we've gotten very good at as a community. The idea of like, you know, having a vehicle or a system or robot or end effector that can move around the world, you typically have a sensor of some kind, you know, a laser range finder or a camera or an RGBD camera. And then that data comes in and it gets processed and turned into an estimate of, say, the state of the world and the state of the vehicle. And then we you know, take that position estimate and we give it to a motion planner and the motion planner then generates a reference trajectory and the reference trajectory is fed to a controller. And then the controller turns you know, that, uh, the current state estimate of the vehicle and the reference trajectory into you know, motor commands in order to follow that trajectory as, as um, accurately as possible. And this happens at a fast duty cycle and this works well. We know how to do this very, very well. Um, this layer of the architecture, unfortunately, is only good for getting from one point in configuration space to another point in configuration space. And there's lots of times where that's all we need. But certainly, as we get to higher level autonomy, we want our vehicles to actually be able to do more complicated missions that are more than just a, a problem of getting to a particular configuration. And so pretty much every single uh, system and vehicle that we have that does anything more complicated has sitting on top of it some kind of symbolic or semantic representation. 
And the way this works is it runs at a much slower duty cycle. And we take the state estimate and maybe the map that we're estimating along uh, with the state estimate, and we extract some kind of symbolic uh, uh, representation, like we're, we're on a road or we're in a room or we're you know at, at this part of the environment. Um, and then a symbolic planner thinks, OK, well, at a high level, what I really want to do is I want to go to the next uh, sub goal location. And so it has some discrete representation of like, go to a street address or return to base or something like that. Um, and then that uh, high level action is then fed down to the motion planner. And, you know, it, it's very, very unusual to have a robot not have some kind of uh, thing like this. And uh, one thing that we know is that the lower part, the fast duty cycle section works very well. And the other thing that we know is that this symbolic representation up here is the thing that always breaks. And why might it be the thing that always breaks? This is the thing where like, you, you know, uh, the representation is missing a particular, you know, attribute, or we need to add some extra sub goal, we've forgotten some condition or some constraint or, or something on here. W what do I mean by forget? You know, how do we leave something out? Uh, it's that leaving something out is where the failures come from. And where do, why are we leaving things out? Well, all of these arrows represent essentially information flow. And each of those arrows also represent, uh, also contain, I haven't drawn on the slide, but they contain a model. So to turn our sensor uh, data into a state estimate, we typically have some kind of system identification. To get our controller to actually control the motors accurately, we also have system identification. The point is, is that all of these arrows are places where we can actually learn the model from data. And that's great because uh, that allows us to make sure we capture the conditions that we're gonna be operating in. But I, had, I couldn't draw in green these two arrows. And that's because we don't actually know how to uh, uh, learn these from data. What inevitably happens is that some grad student or some engineer basically sits down and writes a bit of Python or C++ that converts our numeric state estimate into the symbolic representation of like being on the road or being at an address. And similarly, you know, the same grad student or uh, uh, engineer wrote down a snippet of Python code or C++ that converts high level goals into numeric positions in the world. And it's this engineering by graduate student or engineering by engineer or model specification by engineer is the thing that always breaks our heart. And the reason we have to do it this way is because we actually don't have a well post statement for what symbolic representations, what are good symbolic representations and what are bad symbolic representations. If you're gonna learn something, then you have to have an objective or a loss function that says what is a good learned model and what is a bad learned model. So that raises the question of like, what are symbols really for? We actually have, we started, we have some partial answers. So in planning, you know, people have started to show that like, you know, discretization ensures completeness, especially in a hybrid dynamical system. People like Mark Dusant, Chris Hauser, others. Um, and then people like, um, this guy and Marty show that abstraction reduces computational complexity. Leslie uh, Cabling and Tomas Lozana Perez have also shown how abstraction reduces com computational complexity for planning. And this is really the entire field of task of motion planning. So you can in principle write down a, a, a symbolic representation and verify it for completeness. And you can also uh, show computationally that it made things run faster. But that doesn't help for necessarily for perception. In communication, it's also the case that discretization allows us to talk to humans because humans don't talk very well in numbers. And it also abstraction reduces bandwidth. So you can take your map and you can compress it very nicely into, you know, instead of series of pixels, you know, a polygon, or even just a point estimate, like this is the road, this is the, the, the base location, et cetera. But what are symbols for in perception? And so here we really don't, and I, I would love to be able to answer that question in this talk. That's gonna be hard for me to do. Um, but what I am, what we can at least try and uh, make some progress on this question. So one thing we can say is that symbols might be good for reducing the complexity of the model. So if I have like an RGB image here, there's clearly a door there, the RGB image, you know, maybe it's not R64 by 480, maybe it's, you know, zero to 255, but the point is it's very, very high dimensional. Um, if I recognize that that's a door, then I can represent the door as a, a location, maybe a height and width, the, the, uh, the, the position of the revolute joint, et cetera, and I can probably get it down to an 11 dimensional vector. But reduction of model complexity doesn't seem to be enough because I still don't have a well-posed uh, objective function or loss function that says that this got better because maybe I threw away information that I needed. Notice my R11 might not actually have the, the handle. It certainly doesn't include the little facets of the door. So, so what do I need and what do I not need? So one thing we can observe for perception is that it might be that the correlation between the metric information 
And the fact that this is a door, that may be implicit information. So maybe I can regularize in order to improve estimated locations, et cetera. So it might be the case that symbolic information is actually another kind of information that approves my overall ability to perception and, and estimation. And so that raises then the question is what is the right way to represent our symbols for perception? And that's, that's, that's going to be the rest of the talk. So how should we, let's assume that we, I'm going to take as given that we have the ability to detect objects. So I'm going to assume that we have object detectors and I'm just going to try and answer the question of like, you know, how does that actually help our perception system? So we often represent objects once we've detected them using something like, you know, uh, Segnet or YOLO, et cetera. Um, um, that, well, I guess not Segnet, but YOLO would certainly do it. Um, that uh, we represent objects as point estimates. Centroid of the bounding box is, is a, perhaps a noisy point measurement and we can treat the bounding boxes as measurements. One thing that does is it requires the centroid of the bounding box to correspond to the centroid of the object. And that is problematic in a bunch of situations. So here's a image of a car and some windows and notice that like the cars, that the centroid of the car object is probably the centroid of the car, but the window object here, it isn't because I, the ed, this edge of the uh, window was occluded by this pillar. And so I actually don't know how far in, into the, um, uh, behind the pillar the, the window uh, extends. And so I might get the centroid of the window wrong. And as, I, as the occlusion goes away, I'm gonna have very inconsistent measurements. Also, same thing as over here, the edge of this window is um, uh, not occluded, but cut off by the edge of the frame. And I might believe that the world tends to symmetry. And so what that means is that I've lost nearly half the window. So the centroid of this bounding box is really badly aligned with the centroid of the window. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually infer a connection between what I know about the semantics of cars and windows and other objects and correlate them to what I know about how the world is, is operating. So th what this does is first it allows me to actually represent the landmark, not as a point, but as a volume. And I'm going to uh, represent the uh, objects as uh, ellipsoids. And so what this does immediately is it allows me to uh, not treat the bounding box as a bounding box, but it's four separate measurements of the extent of the ellipsoid of the object. Um, and so, you know, I can now reason about, so this green bounding box here caught the fr uh, front of the car, I can reason about each of these edges separately um, as a uh, limit. And I can notice that this particular edge here, for instance, is uh, rep represents an occlusion boundary. And in fact, is not a statement about the extent of the ellipsoid. And so allowing for each edge to be treated as outlier inlier independently, better occlusion handling, and also better discriminative landmark recognition. Um, why ellipsoids? Well, one, they're low dimensional, uh, nine degrees of freedom. And it also gives me a clean mapping from the, the bounding box edges to a smooth closed form gradient. So I can basically do estimation in closed form from, from the measurements. And that's, uh, and that's very nice. Um, there is one problem. So I have nine parameters instead of three. And so I need more measurements. And so that requ uh, requires me to have a, a good baseline. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if I want a good baseline, I essentially the way that I ensure that I have a good baseline is I put the onus on the planner to actually think hard about the what is happening with respect to my estimates of the ellipsoids and make sure I get a good sequence of measurements that give me a good baseline. So this is a video uh, here of just a, a, a synthetic camera orbiting these objects here. Black is ground truth ellipsoids, red is the estimated uh, ellipsoids. That's not bad. You can see the sort of simulated camera bounding boxes uh, showing up here. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, we were not the first person people to notice that ellipsoids are generically useful for uh, this kind of estimation. Nico Soderhoff and others uh, uh, actually did uh, develop the, uh, the kind of planning work that ensures that you get good baselines. But the problem with uh, needing good baselines and putting the onus on the planner is sometimes the planner can't. So you'll notice if I go back to that video for a second, you'll notice that what the camera was doing is actually changing the field of view um, as a sort of orbiting around these objects. And sometimes you can't change your field of view. If you're a car with a fixed forward facing camera, you might actually not be able to sort of aim the camera at the scene the whole time. You're getting a lot of off to the side measurements. And so what you see here, if I play that video again, is that you know we actually get some pretty bad estimates of the ellipsoids. This red one over here is, is completely misaligned with that one. And the same thing is in the middle. So what can we do about that? Well, again, I observe that the kind of data association problem or maybe data association technique we wanna take advantage of is the relationship between the geometry and the thing that we're looking at. 
So we know we're looking at, we've detected a car, so we know about cars and we can do the same thing for other objects in the environment. And we can use that as a prior over how big, uh, a prior over the thing that we've detected. We know roughly how big cars are. We can you know, put a prior over um, the, the ellipsoid to an aid initialization. So that's one thing that we can do. The second thing we can do is we can leverage depth information to add an additional fifth plane. So I got three feature measurements off the front of the car here. I can, I can range off those uh, using structure for motion, and I can use those to actually put an initial constraint inside here. And using that, using the relationship between the, the fact that this is a car and this uh, low level geometric information, I can using that same highly constrained uh, path that was poorly aligned with what the uh, system needed, I can actually get much better estimation over the, um, Ellipse. It's not perfect, um, but it's much, much better. And then if we actually see, see this in operation in, come on, uh, see this in operation, this is actual flight videos, this is our baseline, and you see the very poor estimate of the ellipsoid there on that cart. Let me play that again. The bounding boxes aren't bad, but the bounding boxes are kind of flickering in and out. Um, but the uh, and smart initialization helps uh, tremendously, and then also using the fifth plane to actually get better estimates helps tremendously. See, again, this car, we, we, we do a whole lot better. And then uh, what we see is, um, you know, uh, uh, this is a flight uh, demonstration out at a facility in Medfield. We get overall uh, much better performance. Great. So uh, that's one kind of data association. One thing I didn't talk about is how do we associate the bounding box detections with, from uh, uh, one time step to another? So we're relying on the bounding boxes or the bounding box edges, I should say, over multiple viewpoints to essentially carve out a 3D volume that can be represented by the ellipsoid or, or maybe even a 3D bounding box. Um, but geom geometry is problematic for data association in time. And we said that we need, you know, we're, we're relying on good detections in order to get our geometric estimates to converge reliably. But the 3D geometric information isn't really useful for data association until the geometry is converged. So we kind of have this chicken and egg problem, which is that we really need the geometric information to get good convergence, but we can't do data association using just the geometry until the geometry is converged. So the way that you know, one typically does this is you associate objects using the appearance based cues until the geometry is converged, such as color distributions, gradient based descriptors, 2D image locations, et cetera. And so, you know, let's actually look at how some of these things actually perform on um, a, a Kitty data set. And so I have a bunch of different data, appearance-based data association techniques. Um, and then what we'd really like to see is uh, the top row is the detection IDs and, and the object IDs, ground truth object IDs. And what you'd really want to see is, or, or the darker uh, the, the, conne the connection, the uh, better the data association. And you like to see the object IDs and the detection IDs basically uh, be a, a diagonal of really dark uh, squares with white everywhere where there's no other association. And if I play the video here, unfortunately, that's not what we get. We see a lot of the appearance-based uh, techniques are super confused about which um, object they're actually looking at. And what you see then is that the IDs here flicker from time step to time step. And so that's gonna make, that, that is essentially a complete failure of data association that's gonna completely confuse our ability to consistently estimate the geometry of the objects. So we know that uh, not using the 3D geometry can lead to inferior data association performance. Um, and so how do we actually uh, uh, do this? So here, this is an example from the TUM data set uh, where we're actually trying to track the different objects on a fairly cluttered data set. And then we see the same kind of failures I talked about a second ago, where we get uh, object ID confusion from time step to time step. So this is super preliminary results, but the idea is that we actually do a hierarchical representation where we're doing inference over the objects as patches, as point masses when we have enough information to do that. And then when we can promote the object to a sphere or an ellipsoid, um, we use a different data association technique. And you can see that we get much more consistent estimation of the object. And you can see like the potted plant, which is not gonna be well represented uh, a lot of the time as uh, getting promoted and then demoted as uh, the information uh, changes from uh, levels of either like, you know, simple point masses where we're tracking an RGB space to actual geometric uh, representations um, here. So this is another example where the semantics and the geometry actually give you a uh, much better ability to understand and model the world. So uh, just in the last uh, minute or so that I have here, the thing that I really want to articulate is that um, uh, data association uh, or semantic representations 
for perception really do actually give you um, additional information. They really tell us the, the correlation between symbolic information and metric information. And it's not just a fixed representation. You can actually uh, improve your overall perception time by actually changing the, the, the level of the representation um, based on the information that you have at hand. And of course, it is the case that it you know, improves planet performance as well. These high level representations certainly accelerate planet performance. And then, I, you know, I, I've given some ideas of what are the right way to represent our symbols for perception. Volume, I don't necessarily want to advocate that these are the only ways or this is that we solve the problem. But we should be thinking about volumetric models much more than we are. And we should be thinking about discontinuities in our representations uh, much more than we do. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Nick, for the great presentation. Uh, there is a question um, in chat. Um, so why ellipsoids and what are other alternatives? Like you talk about discontinuities in this slide. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what other options would you think would be useful for other cases? So um, ellipsoids are kind of a funny choice and a lot of objects don't really fit the ellipsoid model well. I freely admit it. The primary reason for the ellipsoids is because it gave us this close form ability to incorporate the edges um, of the, uh, the bounding boxes. So it essentially made, made the math work out. Um, we are exploring 3D bounding boxes, which tend to uh, align with real uh, objects in the real world better. Um, We've thought about a combination of ellipsoids and mesh residuals, um, but I, I don't have a lot to say uh, right now. But it's it, I, I, to the last point on the slide, it, it's it's very clear that ellipsoids are just one choice, and and, and there's a bunch of others. Okay, thank you. And uh, so, if you have other questions for Nick, you can post them in chat. And uh, with this, I'll, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kosas Danilidis. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Nick. So Costa um, uh, is a, a professor at University of Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, he's a, a IEEE fellow. He uh, received uh, many uh, awards. So he got the best conference uh, award at ICRA in 2017 and was a runner-up at CASE, RSS, uh, CASE in 2015, RSS in 2018, and CVPR in 2019. And uh, on a personal note, uh, Costas was my advisor during my postdoc, and I can only recommend him as an advisor. So thank you, Costas. And um, uh, Costas' main interests are in uh, merging traditional computer geometry from computer vision with learning-based techniques uh, for um, applications in uh, manipulation and navigation. Uh, and with this, I'll leave you the floor, Costas. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Roberto. And uh, Kave, thank you for uh, in, uh, organizing uh, such an interesting uh, workshop. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, One second. Is it the main screen or the second screen visible right now? We see the secondary screen. Oh, the secondary, sorry. Uh, right. And now we, we still see it. Usually there I'm is uh, there is on, on the top left there is what displays. Okay. 
now? Yeah. All Correct. right. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how to learn the presentations for correspondence. Uh, this is work with my student, uh, Stephen Phillips, uh, in collaboration with my colleague, Alejandro Ribeiro, and his student, Santiago Paternen. And uh, also, I will mention heavily how we started in the data association work by Zhao Wei, uh, who talked this morning, uh, and uh, Spiros uh, uh, Leonardos. So, uh, as uh, Nick uh, actually mentioned, uh, uh, correspondence is one of uh, the uh, most uh, important problems in computer vision. Uh, which uh, really right now somehow is uh, hidden uh, behind several architectures in several problems. And uh, I would like in this uh, talk, uh, not only to bring it just to the surface and to, to emphasize its importance, but also show how we can use uh, recent uh, deep learning techniques in order to facilitate uh, correspondence. So correspondence, as you see in this picture, uh, we have correspondence between uh, two views, uh, which might have been taken uh, in consecutive points, T and T plus one. We have correspondences between uh, several like uh, times and weathers and might be paintings on the right. Uh, we have correspond semantic correspondences on the bottom left. Uh, also Zawe showed uh, this work, uh, uh, similar, uh, like related work this morning. And uh, we have also corresp my correspondence is even symbolic between objects, work uh, we have done uh, uh, both with semantic objects, semantic key points with uh, Nikolai Atanasov, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, applied it in uh, probabilistic uh, uh, slum. So uh, usually we start from the two view uh, matching, and uh, uh, there uh, uh, we uh, what really facilitated in the past uh, the matching problem was uh, strong uh, feature descriptors like SIFT. And uh, more recently, we try to learn these descriptors with neural networks. Uh, LIFT is one of the state of the arts. And uh, after we usually after we establish some um, uh, initial uh, correspondence uh, with uh, 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 using similarity of the descriptors, uh, we filter them uh, with uh, RANSAC. Uh, uh, which uh, really uh, reflects uh, the geometric constraints of the problem. It might be a bipolar constraints or if you have RGBD uh, 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 signal, uh, might be the procrastis. So recently, uh, uh, the uh, focus there is on learning uh, representations for these uh, 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 features. Uh, two very prominent examples are the universal correspondence network which you can see on the upper right where you uh, apply you try to find uh, really a dense feature correspondence uh, between semantically similar images by training uh, a CMEs network and uh, uh, the lift is uh, another the local invariant feature transform is uh, another uh, correspondence where uh, we really try to learn features that satisfy a good distance uh, uh, which uh, by minimizing a triplet loss uh, between uh, like uh, two positives and one uh, uh, negative example. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, people have realized that by uh, using uh, 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 like graphs uh, to both have uh, intra image uh, and inter image constraints, uh, this uh, might uh, provide uh, very powerful representations. So the most uh, recent example is uh, from uh, uh, the super glue paper from uh, Magic Leap. So graph neural networks, we're going to use them. Uh, th this is just uh, a very uh, brief overview. We're going to use them uh, in this uh, work. Uh, we're using uh, one feature per node. Uh, graph neural networks originally uh, were operating in the spectral domain using the graph Laplacian, but most recent approaches are uh, based on uh, message passing. And there is a lot of recent research uh, by, on uh, large scale uh, message passing, attention mechanisms, uh, uh, and it's uh, heavily used uh, not only in the image, in the computer vision community, but also, for example, on detecting uh, uh, fake news in uh, Twitter. 
Uh, the problem we address uh, here is uh, really not two view matching, it is a multi view matching, where in addition to feature descriptors and geometric constraints, uh, you have uh, uh, an additional constraint which is called the cycle consistency. On uh, the cycle consistency, uh, you have, you really want, as in the picture on the right, that uh, when uh, uh, two features, uh, when a feature corresponds between image I and image J, and image J and image K, then we must correspond to uh, between I and K. So the formulation we adapt for this problem uh, is uh, the formulation of the feature universe, uh, which uh, is that, uh, and it has been mentioned uh, uh, in at least two talks this morning, uh, this formulation uh, is very similar actually to geometric formulations when we do uh, graph pose optimization. Uh, and it says that uh, the same way that uh, we have a really, we try to uh, uh, compute uh, a global pose for uh, uh, every uh, for every robot pose. Here we have sensors. We have uh, uh, pairwise uh, uh, associations, uh, pi, i, j tilde, and the same way we have, for example, pairwise rotation translations. And we try to uh, find, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, filtering them uh, pairwise and triplewise through the cycle consistence, we assume that we have a universe of features uh, where uh, we uh, 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 assume uh, all this universe is really the one that is generating those features. And uh, the correspondence problem becomes uh, uh, really a problem where we have to find the mapping from every image. Uh, to this universe such that uh, it satisfies uh, the uh, uh, constraint that pi i j tilde is pi i pi j transposed. And this problem uh, classically has been solved uh, as a low rank approximation problem uh, where uh, we want uh, the pairwise uh, consistency matrix uh, to be approximated through the universe consistency uh, uh, matrices, which uh, uh, can be formulated on the right as a Lorac approximation problem. And uh, there are several approaches and we have uh, at least uh, uh, like uh, three or four papers from uh, Zhao Weizhou and Spiros Leonardos in my group uh, solving this uh, problem. Now this Lorac approximation, what uh, we, we do when we are using a learning approach uh, is that uh, we are going to use it as a loss. In order to do that, the way to formulate the problem uh, is that uh, we have an embedding of, uh, we try to learn an embedding of every feature uh, in the universe of features. And uh, this is the, unit. let's say we have three features here in this illustration. Uh, and uh, the features are here, uh, the universe uh, features are the columns. This is really like the law of dimensionality. And uh, then uh, for uh, every image, uh, we have uh, a projection of this uh, universe uh, to, every, to every image. And uh, this uh, matrix, uh, E corresponds really to the uh, pi matrix uh, we have uh, before. So when uh, we want to learn uh, this uh, actually embedding matrix E, uh, we have a set of features from multiple images. Uh, we apply a graph uh, neural network uh, where uh, the features are the nodes. And uh, 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 we learn an embedding uh, E exactly from uh, where here the columns uh, are the universe features. And then we have for each row the features at every image. And uh, the data that we have is the adjacency matrix, which we can get uh, from uh, any other approach like from lift or even from traditional approaches like shift. And uh, this is the low rank loss we have used uh, in uh, uh, optimization approaches in order to compute uh, this uh, E matrix. Here, we are learning representations of the features that uh, satisfy this loss. So when uh, we are uh, using this uh, network uh, in uh, a forward in a te during testing, uh, we are uh, outputting directly uh, this uh, uh, low rank uh, approximation. In addition, we can have a geometric uh, consistency uh, as a loss, for example, epipolar constraints. Uh, and uh, this can be added to the loss. And indeed, uh, 
this uh, if we use it uh, we have uh, found out uh, and you can see it on the right that uh, uh, this uh, network uh, really uh, uh, with for example with uh, six views or uh, uh, in the bottom with 10 views it uh, converges uh, much faster and it has uh, a much uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, training error when we use uh, the uh, geometric uh, consistency uh, these are uh, results we have used with standard approaches like uh, the uh, much alternating uh, the alternating least squares uh, or with a very classic spectral uh, decomposition from uh, uh, that was used uh, from uh, Vikas uh, Singh and also from Leo Gibas's group. And uh, we found that uh, our results are really comparable with, uh, when, with when they are run, actually during testing in uh, new uh, unseen data sets, uh, they, are, uh, 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 they uh, perform the same uh, as approximately uh, 15, uh, between 15 and 25 iterations of uh, the non-learning algorithm. So uh, then uh, we thought uh, 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 that's uh, good for, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for uh, 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 like uh, learning the cycle consistency. But uh, going back, and this was uh, implicitly also in the uh, in the talk from uh, Nick, uh, uh, we have. Uh, uh, still a big problem actually with uh, inliers, which uh, we cannot uh, just, uh, we cannot really tackle and uh, uh, in a satisfying way with uh, the cycle consistency. And uh, in the way we were forming the uh, outlier rejection problem is uh, by finding minimal problems, uh, like the five point algorithm or uh, 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 three points uh, in uh, PMP and uh, neglecting uh, and, uh, and uh, rejecting outliers uh, by using uh, RANSAC. But there are several problems like the multi-view feature matching or just uh, like uh, pure optimization problems, by, like post-graph optimization, where we cannot formulate uh, such uh, minimality uh, constraints or, or such minimality constraints are not uh, really uh, powerful enough. And uh, this uh, selection problem, uh, uh, as uh, Nick said, is, uh, appears more in general, uh, like in uh, whenever we try to uh, bridge the gap from uh, pure like uh, signal to uh, uh, to symbols. And uh, I can show you an example here uh, from our work from 2015 from uh, Meng Zhu and uh, Zhao Weizhou, where we try to select like symbolic uh, like uh, key points on a car. And in order to, to, to select this uh, symbolic key points on a car, we have a selection variable X. Uh, we, and, uh, we want uh, really to uh, have uh, to weigh this uh, with an appearance similarity. We have some uh, geometric uh, constraints and uh, we have also some uh, regularization uh, for uh, uh, that uh, is resulting because uh, we use also deformation of the car here and not only rigid transformation. So it's quite under constrained problem. And uh, uh, we pretty much uh, try to solve for this selection variable and uh, by using, uh, we solve this with an ADMM method. And uh, we, uh, we thought uh, how can we incorporate this uh, in a learning approach? Uh, and uh, we started with a more general formulation, which is uh, really from uh, Luca and from uh, Vasilis uh, Zumas, uh, which is the minimally trimmed square, where we have a selection variable S, and uh, we want really to maximize the number of inliers, uh, which is the sum of uh, SK, where SK is a selection variable for every measurement, zero or one, uh, subject uh, to the satisfact uh, to satisfying, uh, for example, the bipolar constraint uh, uh, here, uh, the HK of uh, ZK, which is the uh, measurement. And uh, uh, SK is the, uh, our uh, selection variable. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, some output, which uh, for example, uh, might be the rigid uh, transformation. Uh, and uh, uh, the H uh, here, uh, 
we could still apply, for example, with cycle consistency, but it can be like procrastis, epipolar, or PNP, uh, or any other uh, geometric uh, constraint. And uh, uh, so the, our question was how really to make it, uh, to formulate it as a learning problem in, uh, 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 in order to make it uh, much more flexible in capturing really this distribution of uh, all possible like uh, uh, inliers and uh, outliers. And as an example, this is really work in progress. As an example, uh, I mentioned here the post graph uh, optimization, uh, where let's say we have a lot of uh, actually uh, like also outliers from uh, wrong uh, pairwise uh, measurements. And uh, we want uh, really to select uh, only the good uh, edges. Uh, the way we would formulate it is that we would have pairwise measurement Z. Uh, we would feed them to a graphical network uh, that would predict the selection variables uh, S. Uh, and uh, then uh, this would uh, to get the selection variables S together with uh, the post graph optimization would be fit to a neural network which would uh, get out the actual uh, pose pretty much like a regression. So if we want to combine this uh, two, uh, this is like the uh, neural version of the minimally print uh, squares uh, where theta represents the network. And we want to learn uh, selection variables which depend on the training uh, on the data and uh, on the network and uh, the theta. And uh, this we want to do it by uh, maximizing uh, uh, the uh, expectation. So this is really an empirical loss. And uh, the value of the selection variables S is now a function of the data set uh, D and the network's parameter theta. And the way to solve it, uh, this problem is with a constraint uh, optimization. Uh, I want to uh, really emphasize the difference here that uh, we don't uh, solve it by just uh, adding the losses with some arbitrary coefficient, the way it is done in uh, uh, many networks, but uh, with uh, really trying to solve it uh, with a Lagrangian to in order to uh, really satisfy the constraints. And uh, uh, this uh, formulation here uh, for neural networks uh, has uh, been uh, really uh, first done by my colleague Alejandro Ribeiro and his group, uh, and they want also the best uh, student paper at uh, ICASP a uh, few weeks ago. And uh, what uh, they have shown is uh, really that uh, the duality gap of this problem is uh, zero, uh, unlike the non-neural version of this problem. And uh, using a quite sophisticated proof uh, with uh, using the expectations and the universal approximation theory for uh, 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 deep uh, neural networks. So this is our ongoing uh, work. Uh, and uh, we are the first uh, application we're going to use it is in uh, post graph uh, optimization. Uh, so that was my talk. Uh, this is really all this work and uh, has been funded by the, the sister program, which is also sponsoring this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, this was our really our up the first uh, set steps uh, towards uh, not only learning. Uh, uh, the actual correspondences, but uh, also selecting uh, in layers, which is a much more general problem, like in uh, uh, in post graph optimization or even in detecting uh, uh, semantic uh, key points, for example. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. It's really great to organize the workshop. Thank you, Costas, for the great presentation. Uh, unfortunately, in the history of time, we don't have much time for questions, but again, um, think, uh, if you have questions, please post them uh, in the chat uh, and we can keep the conversation going there. Um, so uh, our next speaker, it's Jonathan Howe. Uh, Jonathan, he's a professor, uh, Richard McLaurin professor in the uh, Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, at MIT. Um, he's a fellow of uh, IEEE, and the American Institute of Aeronautics and uh, um, uh, Astronautics. 
He's editor in chief of uh, Control System magazines and he writes very nice editorials for the magazine. Um, he received uh, many best paper awards from uh, I, uh, AIAA and um, um, specifically in 2011, 2010, 2013, and uh, also um, uh, awards from uh, IFAC. His uh, in research interests uh, span uh, um, controls augmented with um, learning and uh, the overall team it's uh, uh, making systems that are robust to uncertainty and uh, um, disturbances. And uh, looking forward to this talk, uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Robert. I'm just checking, you can see the slides, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and no, I actually stepped down from editor-in-chief, so I have a lot more free time now, so it's, uh, <clears throat> um, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to give a talk today on consistent multi-view data association. We're going to touch on uh, multiple themes uh, during the talk. Several of them have come up in previous talks, so we can build on some of those ideas. Uh, so I'll be presenting work that's from Cave, who helped uh, sponsor this workshop or develop the workshop, Kazra, Yulin, and uh, Parker. Um, so we're all working together in the aerospace controls lab. Uh, and like I say, it's uh, on ongoing work. Um, so the goal of this is uh, to try to fuse a, a bunch of disparate, um, uh, well, disparate views from the different agents in, in a problem. And so in this first animation up here, we have a situation where we have agents that have different views of objects in the world. There is a universe. Uh, we don't know how large that universe is. And so one of the things we have to do is to estimate the size of that. Uh, but we'd like to try to make associations between the robots uh, or the different views all, as to which, which are the same thing. And <clears throat> So part of the challenge is that the fusion requires or the fusion process that we want to do in terms of localization, both for ourselves and for where the objects are located, requires we both identify and associate these identical and or sort of similar objects. The challenge, one of the other challenges, of course, is that these observations are both noisy and incomplete. Uh, and as sort of indicated in the animation up here, we're not necessarily seeing the same things, though seeing things that look similar. Uh, Statue of Liberty with two arms as opposed to one, and so you see errors like that. Um, you can use pairwise techniques, but those tend to lead to suboptimal and or inconsistent solutions. And so the approach we've been looking at then, similar to some of the other talks today, is to try to associate the observations jointly ac and across all views and then rectify the errors. And the idea being that once we've done that, we can then perform the data association. We sort of line up the different objects uh, and then we can fuse them together. And so ideally what we'd be doing across a multi-robot team is to be able to come up with a better localization for our position and, and or where the objects are themselves. So the key insight then is that we're leveraging cycle consistency. And you've seen this mentioned several times. It was in Costas' talk, and I think Florian mentioned it this morning as well. So uh, they've given me a, a sort of given some good background and, and results in, in the different techniques. But essentially what's happening up here is we're getting inconsistent views. And so it's a situation where in a pairwise sense, A, B, and B, C have identified uh, sort of correct um, pairwise linkage but C had an incorrect one, but because of we, well, the approach is to use the cycle consistency principle to, to rectify those errors and then obtain a consistent solution. Um, however, as, as, and I think Florian mentioned this before, is that the, uh, the problem formulation in, can be written as an integer program, um, as many things can, uh, but is often the case that ends up being computationally prohibitive for large problems. And so there are um, existing state-of-the-art solutions, but they do tend to be computationally expensive and, and or inaccurate. So typically you'd be looking at a graph like this or sort of a comparison where you're looking at uh, sort of a, 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 the accuracy of the technique and, and or the runtime of the technique. And you get a spectrum of solutions shown here. And there's a bunch of papers from the different uh, boxes in terms of convex relaxation, spectral relaxation techniques, and then graph clustering. And we sort of give an indication uh, somewhat as a cartoon as to where you might expect these techniques to fall on these two different axes. What we're looking for then is an algorithm that we call clear. Um, and our approach is going to leverage ideas from spectral graph clustering to obtain cycle consistent solutions that are both computationally efficient and high precision. And so again, we indicate that the technique will end up in the top right, which is ideally where you'd like to be on a graph of this type. Uh, and, and so shown as a cartoon here, but we'll show some numeric results later to support uh, that claim. 
So the key insights in CLEAR then is that the, uh, the problem can be written in a graphical representation. And so the uh, objects then are the nodes in this graph and the associations are the edges. Uh, and the furthermore, if you obtain a cycle consistent association, um, then the graphs will end up being disjoint clusters of, of this form. Uh, and again, one of the things you do have to identify is the size of the universe, uh, but that would end up being the number of these disjoint clusters that actually occur. So there are several key steps in CLEAR, and there's a, be a paper linkage at the end uh, to, if you want interested in the specifics. Uh, but one of the steps is to identify the size of the universe. So you're looking for the number of clusters that actually uh, appear, and that's obtained by the number of eigenvalues in the, in the Laplacian matrix. And that, uh, we just passed that here. But the Laplacian matrix is formed of that graph. You normally take the normalized Laplacian, find the number of eigenvalues, the significant ones, uh, and in this case, it's two. Uh, and that gives you an indication of the size of the universe, i.e. how many of these clusters you're actually looking for. From those eigenvectors associated with those eigenvalues, you then perform an embedding process uh, that shows up in a graph like this. Uh, again, in sort of a cartooning form here, but basically there's a clustering operation that's then done on these, uh, the, the elements of these, of these eigenvectors in this representation, which then gives you a cycle consistent association graph. Um, so again, the point is that we're leveraging the graphs uh, sort of cluster sparsity structure to accelerate this entire eigen decomposition. And that's what's leading to some of the computational efficiencies that we're obtaining. So we look at a standard benchmark problem. We have uh, sort of the CMU hotel. And so this is sort of the, the cartoon of this hotel uh, that shows the sort of animation of it. And then what we have is examples of sort of correspondences between the different, uh, say, three images from that movie. And uh, this was shown before that basically when you're looking for cycle consistent, you're looking for a triangle like this uh, and uh, that's shown by in green. However, sort of some of the poor uh, pairwise associations that have been made are shown here in red. And so what we're looking for then is uh, try to find a way to take these pairwise uh, associations, some of which are inconsistent, uh, feed them into clear and the other state of the art algorithms to try to remove outliers and make the matches cycle consistent. And so if you do that and then perform the operation, and I want to move this thing, I don't know if this thing's showing up in your image, but let me see if I can get rid of it. Um, um, that basically on, on this plot, you're now uh, sort of three things of interest to us. And so we're looking at precision uh, here, we're looking at recall, so those are the two standard things we're looking at, but we're also interested in computation time. And so we'd like to use these types of techniques in real time if we can. So we sort of plot them in terms of rate. So in both of these plots, top right is where you want to be. You want to be able to run at a high rate, but end up with both uh, with good precision. And you'd like to be in a situation where you can have high precision, high recall. So again, you'd like to be up here on top right. So consistent with the type of plot that I, the cartoon plot I showed before, uh, we have an indication here of a bunch of different algorithms showing up on this plot for the CMU Hotel benchmark. Um, and we're comparing a bunch of cycle consistent shown in green and not cycle consistent results shown in red. And again, you can see that uh, clear is uh, up here in the top right. And while spectral solution uh, is sitting close to clear in terms of uh, the rate, uh, when you actually look at it in terms of precision recall graph, it's way over here to the left. So just in terms of computation numbers, we've got some uh, highlights and numbers here. It's 21 times faster than spectral. Uh, note that this is a logarithmic graph here and on the right plot. Uh, it's 39 times faster than uh, this and much, much faster than match lift. So again, clear has improved both the precision and recall of the input set. And so that's indicated here by the orange lines. And so it's again, top right compared to the inputs that were provided. Uh, and so we're in, improving upon uh, the input as well. So that's one data set. Uh, another thing that we uh, often do in our lab, it's uh, we focus a lot on multi-robot problems. We also do a lot of work flying with real robots. And so this is work done uh, actually with uh, Nick Roy students as well. Uh, where we're flying in a forest. Uh, there's actually two robots flying here, each one of them flying around. Uh, they're localizing off the trees. Uh, and when you do problems like this working in a forest, you realize how easy it is to get lost because a lot of these trees ends up looking the same. And so what we're looking at is very similar, uh, if not identical landmarks. But, and so it's a very confusing problem in terms of the data association. And so we're trying to identify both for either a single robot and then possibly between the two robots, uh, whether or not they can actually localize uh, correctly in this type of environment. So the problem here then is to uh, try to get rid of some of these erroneous associations between uh, a bunch of these pairwise associations that were made 
And this baseline plot here shows in red just how many poor or bad pairwise associations have been made. And again, given the similarity of the trees, it's quite easy to make this type of mistake. Uh, but if you run that through the clear algorithm, uh, and the, you, you, things get cleaned up immensely. Um, there are a couple of outliers left in these, these red lines here. And those are mostly due to the fact that we have sort of uh, low redundancy, uh, well, just not many data points to support these, uh, these observations. They can be pruned out relatively easily, and you end up with this being the clear post-process result. You can get similar looking results using a couple of the other algorithms, but what stands out which is when you compare the runtime of clear compared to the others, uh, is significantly faster than the other algorithms for that get similar types of results. So that's just the association part of the problem. When you take that and then combine that with a slam part, if you ran the baseline uh, with all these poor associations, you end up with a very crummy looking solution here. Blue is the, uh, the actual uh, sort of path you would have followed. Uh, and if you don't take clean things up, you end up with this pretty crummy looking result. Um, if you run clear and take this result up here and run it through SLAM, you end up with a very nice representation of the actual path. So a significant improvement over, over accuracy. Um, again, I mentioned that we do a lot of work in multi-robot problems. Not sure what happened there. Um, I'm supposed to keep running. Uh, this is a recent result working in, in simulation. Uh, uh, given the COVID-19 problems, not being able to get out much into the lab uh, or the real world. But here we're running around the, the examples we're pulling out in this case are cars. And so we're identifying uh, sort of objects in that world. Uh, but there are five robots driving around in the world in total. They have about 30 to 80% overlap in the trajectories. And what we're trying to identify is the total number of objects that actually exist in this world, given a lot of redundancy in the data. So we're looking at the pairwise associations, and then we're going to try to from that down, uh, sort of compress that into an accurate representation of the total number, similar to what we were doing before. <clears throat> so when you do that and you run clear, uh, it ends up with an estimate that the ground truth number was actually 35 objects, the, the red cars in the world. Clear comes up with an estimate of about 38. I can get when we ran it actually fails and gets an estimate up around a uh, thousand. Um, so that's the first step in the algorithm, which is estimating the total number of objects. Then you have to go through the process of actually figuring out uh, sort of and um, doing the cycle consistency part of the calculation. Similar plots before precision versus rate, precision versus recall. And again, we have the clear being on top right in, in all of these cases. Match ALS uh, does show up here uh, sort of to the right of clear, but it's red uh, mark here because it's not cycle consistent. And if you want to actually get a good estimate of the total number of objects, you have to have a cycle consistent algorithm, which you can modify the result of match ALS to make it cycle consistent. But when you do that, it ends up being down here. And so the precision drops off uh, quite, quite dramatically. So again, just to highlight, clear is top right in each of the figures while being significantly faster than, than a lot of the other algorithms that exist. So uh, that just gives you a highlight of, of uh, some of the work we've done so far in clear. Uh, a couple of uh, sort of um, things to note down here. There is uh, both a paper available and uh, code if you'd like to test it or, or take a look at the results. Um, and uh, so the current work then, as we've been looking at, is, is centralized. And we sort of think about a graph like this over here in terms of sort of a combination of network quality and, and sort of the extent to which we are connected or not to a centralized server. So we're sort of operating currently up here in the top left, where we're assuming good network. And we're also assuming that we have relatively short disconnects from the central server. Ideally, we're able to populate the rest of this, uh, this block diagram, this, this figure here, and come up with situations where we can handle both good and bad network connectivity uh, and short and long disconnects from a centralized server, thus leading to situations where we have sort of an asynchronous distributed type of calculation that we can do of, the, of this form. And we've actually been doing some work recently in developing a distributed implementation, actually, with Costas's group, uh, and we've shown that we can get similar accuracy as a centralized solution. Uh, but the computational capa capability now is distributed across the uh, uh, across the entire team, and so uh, we're working to extend that result to handle an asynchronous communication uh, situation as well. And finally, with the the uh, so the other extension we're looking at is everything we've been talking about so far has been binaries uh, as as the association we're making. We want to extend that to things like point clouds, which will require we start thinking about matrices instead. And that will allow us to include uh, a lot more information into the association that we're doing uh, than, than what we've been able to accomplish so far. 
And uh, we expect that will significantly improve the data association accuracy and also generalize the, uh, the domains uh, type of problems that we can uh, address with this type of association software. All right, and with that, I will stop um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, John. Um, I have uh, well uh, waiting for questions. Uh, please remember you can raise your hand in the participant list or you can uh, post it in chat. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned uh, determining the number of entities in the universe. Uh, exactly how do you do that? And uh, if you get it wrong, what are the effects on the final result? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, and uh, one of the advantages of having Kevin here is I can actually have him answer the question. For me, <laughs> but, um, so, uh, well, it's actually an interesting question. And one of the things we've looked at when we first started this was, uh, let me just go to the, the right slide here. Um, um, I think it shows up in the animation this way. Um, I, we found the results to be relatively insensitive to that number, provided you get a reasonably good estimate of what's going on. Um, it, but basically what's happening down here is that there is actually an algorithm that we run on uh, this normalized Laplacian. So it sort of will spit out these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, but this is typical of the types of things that one experiences when you're doing, um, like I, I've done work on system identification in the past where you form essentially a Hankel matrix and then you look at the, the eigenvector spectrum. And what you're looking for is essentially a gap between you know, numbers that are low and numbers that are not low. And in this case, the numbers that are low are the, the 0, 0 0.1. Um, and there is a gap. And so in a situation where you have a significant gap, like here between uh, 0 and 0 0.1 and then 0.8, you see that gap and you're able to, to then identify the transition between what is essentially the, you know, the, the number of objects and what then becomes the rest of the noise in the problem. Um, but there is, um, in, in other situations that we've been looking at where we've been thinking about, again, not just binaries in the association, but also weighted graphs, uh, there's a little less clarity in, in that gap. And so one has to think very carefully about that number. So that, that's, I think in the problems we've done so far, it's been relatively clear uh, in, in, in those situations, in the examples and the benchmarks, sort of how to identify that gap. But in some of the generalizations we'll be doing in the future, I think it's uh, more work is required to come up with an algorithm for, for making that choice. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you again for the talk. And uh... Now it's time to introduce the last but not least uh, talk of this session. Um, the talk is by John Leonard. Um, and uh, John Leonard uh, is a Samuel Collins Professor of Mechanical and, uh, and Ocean Engineering at MIT. Uh, his group uh, uh, is, part, uh, is part of the of CISEL at MIT. Um, John uh, is an uh, expert in uh, everything related to SLAM. And if you really need a, a historical perspective on SLAM, I cannot recommend anybody uh, more, uh, with, which is more, who is more knowledgeable than uh, John uh, in uh, this uh, topic. Uh, with this, John, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Um, thanks for this opportunity. I, um, I love this topic. In fact, I, I had great ambitions for this talk. I, I really wanted to give a kind of historical arc of kind of past, present, and future. Uh, with only 15 minutes, I'm not going to do it justice. And I'm a little distracted by the ISS docking uh, that's happening right now, and I'll explain why. Um, so my title is a Re Research Agenda for Robust Act Semantic SLAM. And um, let's see, a confession. I probably overdo the history stuff, but um, uh, I, I guess I, a confession, I'm still working on my PhD thesis, which I started in 1987, uh, where uh, the goal has been to enable robots to understand the world, to know where am I, where am I going, uh, what's around me, uh, and um, to, to this sort of spatial intelligence. If anyone saw Andrew Davison's talk for the Robotics Today kind of worldwide seminar a few weeks ago, um, that's a wonderful compliment in terms of the things I, I, I um, the, the progress the field has made is just amazing. 
Um, and I feel um, uh, today in spring 2020, I wish we were all in Paris. Um, I had many fond memories as a grad student um, working, uh, actually made 10 trips to Paris as a grad student working on some early slam uh, attempts at localization systems. And my grad students and I, um, I, I um, we um, were kind of partners in this endeavor to sort of bring autonomy forward. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to try to highlight maybe some of Kevin's work. I better point you to David Rosen's work on uh, with Luca on certifiably robust perception. Uh, and uh, I love all my students, past, present, all my past postdocs, uh, and they're all kind of partners in this endeavor. I almost feel like I've been part of a 30-year Zoom call with the SLAM community uh, trying to attack some of these questions. And so um, one thing that's a little unique about our group, although we haven't been as much in the water lately, we're really motivated by autonomous underwater vehicles. This is a hostile remote environment where you're gonna have restricted communications. Um, and we wanna to get towards systems where you can really trust that they're gonna do the right thing, that they're gonna find the right object. Um, um, this picture just shows a slime system we did uh, with um, uh, many contributors, but um, John Fulkerson, Morris Fallon back in uh, about seven years ago. Uh, this is uh, a Remus vehicle that did mine hunting uh, or object search for the Navy. Um, this uh, is a little historical photo circa 1999 of uh, one of the very first Remus systems with one of my grad students at the time, Chris Cassidy, who did a master's on Remus navigation. Um, and Chris happens to be the person that's opening the hatch on the ISS right now uh, for the arriving Crew Dragon. So one of the great advertisements for being a professor is that your students will go on and do amazing things that you never could envision. Um, and it's really just an honor um, to have like so many great um, being part of this wonderful worldwide community thinking about robot navigation. So looking back for myself as a student, my advisor, Hugh Dorant White, um, was a champion of trying to represent uncertainty in combining sensor, sensor data from multiple positions. And it was always meant to be about objects. So SLAM was always meant to understand the world in terms of objects. This is a shot from Hugh's thesis. Uh, and we actually endeavored to try to use vision in 1987 when I was a grad student. Um, and the original plan was to use vision to implement navigation using objects, which we would call geometric beacons. Um, and this is me in the lab at Oxford in the late 80s uh, with my Robuter Robosoft vehicle. And our early attempts at computer vision with something like called the data cube uh, were just hopelessly not near real time. So order of, you know, three hertz to do county edge detection. And then what do you do with the detected image? So we pivoted to using sonar. Um, and uh, when I was a grad student, uh, think of the world uh, the young people out there before Google Scholar, before Archive, you know, like walking to the library with your um, uh, 10 pence coins to use the copier to find someone's paper. Um, and for me, the sort of the, the early prehistory of thinking about uh, representations towards semantic understanding of the world. Um, we have, you know, the shaky robot, uh, the tremendous early work at, at LAS uh, in Toulouse, uh, and Marvick's work um, at Stanford. Uh, and not to be forgotten, Ben Kuyper's professor now at Michigan, he really thought about AI as a mapping and navigation as a spatial intelligence problem and coined the term the spatial semantic hierarchy. And in his thesis, he talked about this as a sort of topological map of some of the uh, streets in Cambridge uh, in Massachusetts. And um, if you think about Hans Marvick, um, I have this, uh, you know, these the historical... Marvick started what he thought would be a very simple task. He hit a problem. There were things that, although they at first looked like they might be easier because human beings do them more easily, that in fact turned out to be heartbreakingly difficult. And those were things like looking at the world and seeing what objects there were in front of the camera that was connected to the computer and moving around competently in the world, you know, the, the typical robot tasks. So note that he Each used the word flash objects. here represents 15 minutes of computing time. So imagine 15 minutes to process a set of, set of stereo images in the 1970s. Um, the goal always was to understand the world in terms of objects. And um, uh, for me, I had to revert to using sonar, uh, these Polaroid ultrasonic ranging sensors, which up in the right here is a typical scan in a small part of uh, an office. And I basically was pulling my hair out trying to understand this data. Um, um, this is what the room corresponded to. And um, for me, the, the, the savior for my uh, compressed three-year PhD in England um, was the wonderful book, Tracking and Data Association by Jakob Barcelone uh, and Thomas Fortman. 
And really, uh, uh, you know, Nick Roy earlier mentioned about Kanata, uh, Takeo talking about correspondence and just understanding uh, data association and it just couples back to representation. And so for myself, you know, in my thesis, you know, a fundamental requirement is the task of achieving, maintaining correspondence. Uh, what is being measured um, and uh, really successful use of sensing requires overcoming correspondence. And ideally, you know, for, for, for our robot navigating using sonar, this is an early screen recording, very primitive using uh, kind of uh, range measurements of geometric features in the world, um, but showing the ability to correct for drift and localize a robot. Um, um, and really it's about fighting uncertainty in the face of data association. And when I think about, um, you know, the SLAM problem, uh, my, my career, I've tried to think about it with my many postdocs and students, that there's this multidimensional space of topics, representation, inference, and then systems and autonomy, that maybe each PhD student might take a one unit step in this multidimensional space, trying some sort of hypothesis. But really, the, the beauty of this robot navigation problem is that, um, you know, we, we couple representation, inference, and, and systems work. And so this sort of age old question, metrical versus topological representations, bringing in dense representations, which with GPUs are just revolutionary. And I credit the work of Renato uh, and Davison's group and, uh, and Richard Newcomb. Um, objects, we always wanted to represent the world in terms of objects. And obviously you know about SLAM++ and sort of attempts to think about SLAM in an object-based framework. Um, but one of the reasons for going to objects is it's a much more compressed representation. Another is it's more human level as we strive towards robots and can interact with humans, uh, rather than having, you know, huge vast arrays of point clouds and GPUs, can we get to object representations that humans uh, we'd be able to understand, leading towards semantic understanding. And I actually tried to search, what are the origins of semantic mapping? And uh, there's a one, one or two page Frank Dellert AAAI workshop paper from 2004, where he talked about trying to make semantic models. And I think, um, you know, one of the other things is biologists think a lot, it's almost a problem in physics, going back to our philosophy, Aristotle, how do you represent the world, you know? And, and so um, we're collaborating with Roberto and his colleagues in neuroscience at BU on a new project, um, the Neuroautonomy uh, um, Neuri project, where they look at how animals navigate, grid cells, place cells, and the whole question between a local representation versus something that's uh, more earth-centered. And, and David Rosen, you know, recent, my former student, post, now postdoc at LIDS, who's, uh, uh, you know, SLAM is global geometry from local measurements. And this sort of global versus local and object representation questions, they're really fundamental. So the punchline of my talk is despite all the progress in machine learning, there's still a lot of great work to do here to couple these things together. So when we go to inference, um, obviously state estimation, um, and historically, we used common filters. We couldn't think of anything that would ever run on, uh, that beyond that on a, on a, on a robot's um, CPU. Data association couples to that so we can get the right measurements with the right states. Um, historically, for me, uh, Jose Nira and Juan Domingo Tardos were two uh, really pivotal, important colleagues in the late 90s who really championed data association uh, and, 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 and joint compatibility branch and Brown and consensus data association and some of the ESP map, the early implementations. And then now obviously in 2020, we can embrace learning, but uh, I think we need to, I, I'm sort of against a complete black box end to end view uh, that because I want systems, I wanna deploy systems and make them autonomous. I don't just want a graph in a paper. Um, I want a couple perception to planning and control and go from demo to deployment underwater, self-driving cars, space, places where we really want the system to be robust. Um, actually, if anyone saw the yesterday in the rocket when the Falcon 9 was coming back towards the, the uh, of course, I still love you, uh, docking ship, and the, and the video went out for a second. As a roboticist, I was like, oh no, the video went out. And then the video comes back in and the rocket is standing there. And it's like, oh my God, that's what we need for slam in old people's homes. That's what we need slam uh, for cars and city streets. We want the robustness, that ability to just know that we close the loop, it's doing the right thing. Okay, so, so the beauty is that we're coupling all these things together and obviously the community's made a lot of progress, but I wanna articulate to you, I think there still are some great questions. And so um, 
Um, let's see. So I'm using too much time. So there's obviously been recent progress in visual detection that's amazing. I just pulled an image, a credit to this person on Median, YOLO V4. It's just like if you've gone back in a time machine in 1970 and told, 1979 and told Hans Marvik, look, we can do this detection. It's like, wow, you're going to put me out of business. Um, but I don't think that means that visual slam or visual perception spatial intelligence is solved. I think we, we um, if you think of applying a detector in a, in a, to a random object, this is a YOLO trained detector applied. Um, what does the detector say? Well, this is from one of my students, Chad, that uh, the robot sees a teddy bear, uh, actually sees two, maybe needs some non-maximal suppression there. Um, but it also thinks the foot of the teddy bear is a donut. And, and I think if you look at the world through the, striving for 80% mean average precision, you know, may, maybe vision, visual detection in this kind of scenario is solved. But if we want to deploy robots in the world where they don't want to make mistakes, for, uh, we, I think we have more work to do. Um, and I, what I would say is, you know, ROC curves keep me awake at night. I worry about the trade-off between false positives and false negatives. For many applications like self-driving underwater, we need to strive towards the perfection point where we have a very, very, very high true false positive, true positive rate with a very, very low false positive, false positive rate. Um, so my research agenda for robust uh, semantic slam, um, we've always wanted to represent the world in terms of objects. Uh, it's sort of a historical story if I had more time that I think the community got away from object-based landmark kind of representations because representing the trajectory of the robot as a sequence of poses with things like postgraph optimization made life easier. Uh, an amazing work on appearance-based loop closure, uh, folks like Mike Milford and, and Paul Newman's group, uh, they, they showed they could charge very large, close very large loops, surprisingly so, with just sort of visual memory, visual learning, visual matching. Um, but I think if we can uh, think about the world in terms of objects, exploit machine learning detection as a sensor, but do not assume that those measurements are perfect. We need to reason about multiple hypotheses and to be ro robust to false positives and misdetections. We need to exploit spatial and temporal information. If anyone saw Yoshio Bengio's ICRA 2019 keynote last year, he quoted another person, Bouton, Bouteau, who said, nature does not shuffle the environment. And if you think about a deck of playing cards, you know, that's been sort of put in sequence, uh, the, the, to a robot, it has a continuous ongoing existence in space and time that we can leverage location and temporal information to make uh, the learning problem easier and more robust, not just have a random shuffled sequence of 100,000 uh, images off the internet. Um, and so um, I think we, we want to exploit this sort of this space and time to and add some, use machine learning to give us semantic labels to the inference problem but the challenge is we have to fight the computational complexity that comes when we go to mix of continuous and discrete problems. So um, we also wanna to try to leverage certified but robust optimization-based perception uh, and close the loop via, via active test directed sensing, sensing with planning. Um, and my ultimate dream is to create systems that can achieve lifelong learning uh, and I'll call it fleet learning of how many robots can kind of improve their performance over time sharing information with other agents. Dieter Fox famously said about 10 years ago, once, robot, one, once one robot recognizes a Coke can, every robot should recognize a Coke can. Um, and that's kind of my kind of aspiration. Uh, and so um, if, you, if you look back in time, just some sort of time highlights, I'm just gonna go back to the, the with, we moved more towards the pose graph, factor graph representation um, that, that are meant, enabled kind of tremendous progress, you know, with things like processing large data sets like the Killian court, data set with, with loop closing. And that was all sort of wonderful work, but we, we need to strive towards keeping the geometry, keeping the poses, exploiting appearance-based loop closing and so forth, but to pull in understanding the world, maybe text, maybe objects, semantics. Um, I think it will lead to more compact representations and better interfacing with humans. So I've just hit 15 minutes. Um, so um, let's see, I'm just gonna uh, go through a little bit longer. Uh, I wanted to say a little more shout out to to some earlier work. Obviously the dense work um, coming out of Davison's lab, really, really powerful. Um, but how do we get the meaning out of the GPU? How do we get things that are sort of more semantic concepts uh, in the world? And I think all of this can kind of come together with pose graphs as kind of a backbone. Um, this is some older work with Tom Whelan and, and uh, in terms of the, how you couple dense um, to, to pose graphs. So if I used a time machine and I went ahead and I said, 
what would SLAM be like circa 2030? Okay, maybe that someone should just forbid any more work in SLAM. You know, even today they say, oh gosh, too much, too much. But I would question, have we achieved robustness and trustworthiness for autonomous systems? Have we enabled long-term deployments, creating systems that improve performance over time so that the probability of the robot getting, we don't want to have a situation where the probability of failure just increases with time because inevitably something goes wrong and the system's not robust. We need almost sort of like representational uh, how, how, to, how to manage very, very large spatial temporal uh, sets of data that the robot acquired. Almost, so I've had this notion, uh, I'll come back to that. Okay, have we capitalized on the promise of machine learning while retaining the desired prop desirable properties of model-based techniques to achieve robustness? Um, have we been able to, to combine, I should say combine, sorry, model-based and learning to achieve the benefits and avoid the pitfalls of both? And finally, I think, how can we learn from biological systems, you know, drawing inspiration from the fact that a mouse navigating in a maze has this amazing lightweight and resilient spatial intelligence um, far beyond anything that we have uh, with much, much greater this sort of power uh, consumption, et cetera. Okay, so, um, so what I'd like to do uh, is to advertise Kevin Doherty's uh, ICRA talk in session MBO 2.5 um, to get a little uh, deep dive on our work um, in this, uh, in this uh, domain, uh, probabilistic data association, via, data association via max mixtures for robust semantic SLAM. And the idea is to try to, um, this works off uh, wonderful work at, with uh, Kostas's group, uh, Bowman, um, um, uh, Anasov, Atanasov, uh, and others um, in, in trying to think about um, bringing in objects into the representation, posing the uh, estimation problem in a way that um, doesn't blow up in terms of computational complexity and still provides robust performance. Um, so just uh, so if we in, and uh, so just a brief advertisement and then I'll take questions. Um, you know, there's obviously been some good, great work and and part of this is we have to go to non-Gaussian representations. So that's how we're going to try to handle the situation. We know machine learning detectors are going to be imperfect, especially when we do domain adaptation and we take a model trained in one domain and apply it in in another domain. Okay, so. Uh, I think what I'll what I'll do uh, is uh, stop there and take questions and let Kevin's video one of them play. So that's 18 minutes. Any questions? I should open the chat. Thank you so much, John. Um, I actually have a question. Um, we we saw from uh, like a previous talk, uh, Cesar, that um, the role of context can be uh, a powerful cue, for instance, for loop closure or uh, localization. Do you have any thoughts in that sense? Absolutely. I think context. It's a bit like um, uh, you know one analogy that I've tried to foster to students in the past is if you think about how Unix works, where there's kind of like virtual memory, like Imagine like you have this kind of local um, RAM, um, but you've got all this kind of uh, virtual memory on disk and you want to kind of do a page swap and you want to kind of page swap in the context into your kind of local scene model in a kitchen that you should have these sort of really good priors for, for coffee mugs and, and, and spatulas and, you, and maybe don't have priors for manhole covers as, as active, you know? And so uh, I think that's a really interesting idea of how you can sort of use a context to provide you know, better predictions. Ultimately, the word I didn't mention in this talk that I should have is prediction. Ultimately, autonomy is going to require the ability to not just see what is there, but to predict what's going to happen next. And context will enable better predictions. Thank you. And uh, if there are no other questions, um, I thank again all the speakers in uh, the session. Oh, uh, there is actually one question just came in. Can you give examples of current research work on lifelong learning, which improve over temporally and especially over large maps? Thank you. Well, um, some slightly older work that I give a big shout out to is the PhD thesis from uh, Sweden at KTH of Roresh Ambrus, A-M-B-R-U-S, which is part of the Strands project, where they tried to look at long, lifelong uh, learning in, in dynamic environments. So there's an interesting problem of what happens when objects move in the world and how you sort of exploit that for sort of discovery. And so um, definitely check out Ambrose, the Ambrose PhD thesis and any, any papers citing that.
Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And thank you again to all the speakers. Uh, we are going for a one hour lunch break. We reconvene here at uh, 1 p.m. sharp. And um, I hope you'll have a nice lunch, even if it's not in Paris and we cannot network as we would like to. So thank you again and see you at one. Thanks, Roberto. Yeah, and I want to also thank all the speakers in this session and uh, we'll come back at one. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started with some of the logistics of the meeting. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so my name is Kaveh Kaysian, uh, and uh, together with John Ha, Alec Koffel, Ethan Stump, and Roberto Tron, we are uh, your host today. Uh, I just want to go over some of the earlier uh, remarks that we had about how to ask questions in case you're joining for the first time. So as I mentioned, we have two methods for attending interactions with the speakers. Uh, to avoid any interruption, we disable the, the, the uh, we, we muted all the participants. Uh, and we would also like to ask you to keep the videos off uh, so we can only see the speakers. Uh, so the, web, the first way of asking question is that the, you can indicate your interest that you want to ask a question verbally from our speakers. Uh, you click on this uh, symbol at the bottom of the Zoom screen that called participants and a panel opens, opens up and in the bottom corner of the panel, there's this raise hand uh, symbol that you click on and the session chair gets notified and they unmute you and ask you to, uh, to uh, ask your question. So the second way uh, is by typing your questions in the chat box. So you simply need to click on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen and then uh, in the panel that opens up on the right, type your question. Your question will be visible to everyone. Uh, I just want to make a remark that you don't need to wait until the end of the talk to type in your question. You can type it as the speakers are presenting and by the time that we get to the end of the talk, the session chair has all the questions and they can ask it from the speaker uh, uh, from your behalf. And as it happened in some of the cases in the morning that we may run out of time uh, and in order to keep the a schedule uh, as before, we may need to uh, skip some of your questions. In that case, we apologize in advance and invite you to send your questions directly to the speakers. So just again to emphasize that we had four themes in the workshop. We have the first theme, mathematical models and algorithmic methods. Uh, second theme is learned models and end-to-end -end data-driven techniques. Uh, third theme deals with applications in robotics, computer vision. And the fourth theme is interaction of learning and algorithmic techniques. So these are uh, indicated here by T1 through T4. More detail is available at the, at the workshop webpage. And we have four speakers for the uh, afternoon session, which is the last session of this workshop, uh, followed up by a uh, a spotlight talks uh, by, uh, by the authors of accepted papers. And uh, here's the schedule of this session. So uh, we first go over our uh, invited speakers talk and then we have the spotlight talk and we have some concluding remarks and end at uh, 2.50 Eastern time. So the second chair will be hosted by, will be chaired by Ethan Stump. Uh, Ethan, are you, are you there? Yes, Kava, I'm ready to get okay. started. Fantastic, so I'll hand it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ethan Stump, I'll be chairing the third session. Uh, we're gonna start off our set of speakers for the afternoon uh, with Luca Carloni. So uh, Luca is uh, the Charles Stark Draper Assistant Professor at MIT. He directs the Spark Lab there. They do work across uh, sensing, perception, uh, autonomy, and, and kinematics. Uh, just general robotics. And throughout his career, he's he's uh, done a great deal to push the boundaries of structured estimation in many forms. And he has a lot of the seminal work in post-graph post optimization techniques, you know, working across a wide 
variety of places, slam, structure for motion, basically all the stuff we've talked about today, he's, he's touched it in some way, shape or form. So without further ado, uh, Luca, the floor is yours. Right, Ethan. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. And you should also be able to see uh, my screen. Yes, we screen. have your screen. Everything looks good. All right. So um, thank you so much for having me. It was, uh, was a great morning. Uh, it was, uh, was very interesting. All the presentation, I really enjoyed them. And it's just a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for organizing the event, also considering how challenging it is to do this uh, virtually. So I'm Luca Carlone. I'm the director of the Spark Lab at MIT. And today I'm going to present work on uh, certifiably robust spatial perception. This is work led by my students, Hank, Pasquale, and Jingnan, as well as Vasilis, who is a research scientist in Spark. So before I start, I want to uh, just uh, have a quick disclaimer. I'm going to focus on uh, certifiable algorithms, not system certification, just to clarify a little bit the terminology here. There is a number of people focusing on uh, establishing guidelines for uh, system certification. What I'm going to talk about in this presentation is uh, certifiable algorithms, which are algorithms for which you have a clear contract, a clear performance guarantees between the input and the output, and in particular perception algorithms for that. I have to admit that eventually we are also very interested in system certification, but most of the presentation today will focus on the algorithmic side of things. So this is the plan for today. Um, I want to tell you what I mean by certifiable perception algorithm. And I want just to provide a couple of examples, which I believe are really uh, changing the picture of how we do LiDAR-based object localization and how we do image-based object localization. And here in this slide, beside the outline, I'm also providing a number of uh, pointers. These essentially are all papers um, published or submitted like, you know, over the last two years in uh, robotics and computer vision conferences. You can uh, look at the papers if you want more technical details. And I will try to wrap up the presentation which, with, with a fast you know, spoiler about fast certification, which is indeed a neat representation uh, from uh, my student, Hank. So let's start with uh, what is a certifiable perception algorithm? So to start with this, I will use a running example. The notion of certifiable perception algorithm is very general, but just to make things concrete, I will uh, consider the problem of object detection and pose estimation. So imagine that I give you a 3D model of a car, and your goal is to detect the car in an image and figure out what is the pose of the car in the image. So the typical way we do this, and we saw similar things in the presentation from Xiaowei this morning, is that first we do some uh, feature detection. Okay, so we detect essentially the headlight, uh, door handle, and uh, this feature detection and matching is typically something that right now is probably like you know, a deep network. And the second step after we have the features attached to this car is that we try to do a model fitting. So we fit the 3D model of the car that we are given uh, such that it matches you know, these points that we detected in the image. And the result is this that you see on the right. You know, essentially the algorithm is able to figure out what is the car in the image. Of course, this is kind of an idealized picture. It's like a simplistic picture because in practice what happens is that uh, you're given an image, you do feature detection and matching and what happens is that the number of points will be off, right? Will not be correct. So you have a number of points which are in layers. These are good data association, good correspondences. And you have a number of points which are outliers, meaning that uh, either they are outside the car or they are characterized by a wrong data association. For example, you know, this point, if a, this point is a headlight, you know, that's a wrong data association. So the first issue is that uh, deep learning based method and in general data association techniques can fail in very unexpected ways. And then also the rest of the pipeline, which is about model fitting, uh, can fail if you have too many outliers. So the issue number two is that model fitting may fail if there are too many outliers. At the same time, there is an opportunity here. If you are able really to detect the liars, we can understand how well the model is fitting the data. And potentially, we can also feedback the same information to the feature detection part. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on very recent work, which is, I think is really changing the picture of the way we do model fitting uh, in estimation robotics and computer vision. And I will start with a few preliminaries. Considering the audience, I will, uh, will go fast through these. You know, they are very standard things. So the standard way you do model fitting in robotics and computer vision is by solving an optimization problem. 
In this optimization problem, you want to figure out uh, an X, let's say the pose of the car, such that you minimize the least squares, um, this least square objective, in which essentially, again, X is the estimate that you want to compute, YI are the measurements, for example, these point features in the image, and RI is the residual error, which is quantifying how well the X is explaining the measurements. And of course, the M is the set of measurements that you are given. So the issue with this formulation is that it's a nonlinear least square problem, which is known not to be robust outliers. So essentially, if you use this kind of optimization problem in the presence of outliers, uh, the algorithm says, I think the car is the one in yellow, which of course, as humans, we realize is completely incorrect. So standard estimation based on nonlinear least squares is not robust outliers. So what can we do? Can we do something that is more robust? Well, actually, we just have to look at the extensive literature on uh, robust estimation. And we can find, for example, a, a cost function, which is a truncated least squares, which is way more robust outliers. OK, so let me explain a little bit what this cost function is doing. So you can see that besides estimating the x here, which is the pose that we want to estimate in our case, there are also binary variables theta. And theta essentially are doing classification. They're saying is it either an inlier, in which case theta is equal to one, or an outlier, in which case theta is equal to zero. And you can see that uh, when theta is equal to one, essentially this term disappears. And just left with the uh, least square term, which is the same as the outlier free case. Instead, if for a measurement theta is equal to zero, this disappears, and we are only left with the second term which is uh, this bar C, which is a constant. Okay. So one way to think about this is that uh, this formulation for outlier robust estimation is trying to, at the same time, estimate a variable and also doing classification of inliers and outliers. For those of you who are more familiar with optimization, you can think that uh, while standard estimation is minimizing a least square, a quadratic cost function, the one at the bottom, which is a truncated least square, is simply a quadratic function which is truncated after some, uh, some value, which is the thing that essentially gives robustness to outliers. So people doing robust estimation for the last 40 years, uh, they gave us great tools and great um, formulations for uh, this kind of robust estimation problems with outliers. The only thing that they didn't give us is, the, is good, good tools to solve this kind of optimization problem. So the optimization problem that you see at the bottom of this slide is a very challenging optimization problem to solve. And indeed, one of the most common heuristics to solve problems which are very similar to these is uh, RANSAC, which is an heuristic based on sampling. So my concern about RANSAC is the following. Uh, here I'm showing on the right hand side the probability of failure of RANSAC for increasing percentage of outliers. And you can see that RANSAC actually works pretty well when you do not have many outliers. But the issue is that below some beyond some point, let's say 70% of outliers, Ransack will essentially fail with high probability, okay? And even worse, Ransack is going to fail and is going to give a solution without telling you that it's a wrong solution. Okay, that's really problematic if you're thinking about applications for uh, self-driving cars or safety critical applications. So the one I'm showing here in the picture is actually a best case for Ransack. I'm using like, you know, hundreds of iteration. I'm using a three-point Ransack. If I'm considering other problems with like, you know, five point Ransack or eight point Ransack, you can see that the situation gets very bad. So these algorithms actually fail with a high probability even for like, you know, low uh, percentages of outliers. So really the core of this presentation is to propose a new perspective, which is this idea of certifiable algorithms. So a certifiable algorithm gets some uh, measurements, YI as input, and again, a certifiable algorithm is trying to figure out, to estimate the x, the variable x that we want to figure out, for example, the pose of the car, by solving this optimization problem. And we produce an estimate x star of the quantity x that we want to estimate. So a certifiable algorithm is a fast, meaning polynomial time algorithm, that is able to solve outlier rejection, which is this optimization problem, to optimality in virtually all problem instances, or detect failure in the worst case, which is about you know, what we call optimality, you know, certifying optimality. So not only we are trying to solve more problems than Ransack, but we also try to detect when we are not able to solve the problem, which is very interesting for safety critical applications. 
So I'm calling these certifiable algorithms. Sometimes I'm going to use the, the, the term certifiably robust if I want to stress the fact that these are robust outliers. Really, what is unique of this line of work is that it's the first set of works tackling robustness to outliers and optimal solvers, which are robust outliers. So in a nutshell, again, you know, Ransack is, uh, is having this probability of failure for increasing percentage of outliers. What we are shooting for is a certifiable algorithm in which uh, essentially the probability of failure is always zero, except in few instances, but a certifiable algorithm will also detect these instances. We'll tell you like, you know, don't trust the estimate because I'm not sure I was able to solve the problem correctly. So consider that, you know, we are in the COVID-19 era, era, essentially this is about flattening the curve of uh, probability of failure. And there are a bunch of good news, for example, that uh, these worst case instances, which are problematic, are very rare in practice. They are not commonly found in practice. So the algorithm I'm going to discuss, are going to solve pretty much any robust estimation problem that you like. So let me jump to the first example, which is LiDAR-based object localization. And uh, the formulation here is similar to previous formulation that you have seen in presentations this morning. So essentially, we are given two point clouds. One is the object template, is a point cloud, but I'm visualizing this as a solid object. And the other one is uh, a LiDAR point cloud, which can, can be, for example, a scan from a LiDAR. Uh, uh, from a LiDAR. So, we can convert this general formulation for outlier robust estimation, and we can just essentially substitute the R, the residual error, for the residual error in this case, in which we want to detect objects in 3D point clouds. And this problem becomes something that is called robust 3D registration. Okay, so we just replace the R, which is the generic residual, with this expression, which is trying to match point cloud A with point cloud B. And in this case, I have a rotation trying to match the two set of points, but you know, this can be generalized to a pose pretty easily. So I told you what is the goal, you know, we want to design these certifiable algorithms, but how do we do that? So here I'm going to propose a template to get a um, certifiable robust algorithm uh, for the case of object detection in point cloud. And in a nutshell, what we do here is to start with a robust, estimation problem, which is non-convex and combinatorial. It's the hardest problem that you can try to solve if you do optimization. What we do is we show that uh, actually we can rephrase exactly this problem as a QCQT, a quadratically constrained quadratic program. But here we're not gaining much. So this problem is still non-convex and still hard. But what we do finally is to get a convex relaxation of the QCQT. And you notice the errors here while the robust registration problem and the QCQP are equivalent, the convex relaxation is not necessarily equivalent to the QCQP. But we can design results, theoretical results, saying when essentially the convex relaxation is equivalent to the other ones. And here the theorem is saying that essentially if the solution Z star emerging from the convex relaxation as rank one, then the Z star can be factored into X transpose X, and X is the optimal solution for the original intractable problem. Okay, so we can solve the convex relaxation, and if the solution has rank one, then we actually solve outlier uh, robust estimation. So the amazing thing here is that uh, essentially for the convex relaxation that we design, empirically the relaxation is always tight, meaning that the, the output of the relaxation is always rank one which is kind of an amazing uh, observation, except for rare worst case instances, which are very difficult to find in practice. In the paper, we provide way more uh, results, and in particular, we state what we call estimation contracts, which are essentially saying uh, when the approach that we propose, which is called teaser plus plus, is able to recover the correct pose, which is unique, you know, our unique results in the literature. So this is the theory. The experiments, I think, are quite uh, amazing. Um, we have, like, you know, extreme performance and uh, accurate performance in the presence of extreme amounts of outliers. Here, what I'm showing are results on RGBD point cloud data sets in which you have to do object detection. For example, we have to detect a uh, serial box in the 3D point clouds. And here, these are quantitative qualitative results in which you see that the serial box, you know, we localize the serial box. And you can see that in practice, you always have for the approach that's used for, uh, for uh, feature detection, which is FDFH, 
we actually have a huge amount of outliers, which really motivates why we need techniques which are extremely robust outliers. Other qualitative results, you know, comparison of TSER++ against, against Transac, uh, we essentially beat Transac in very extreme conditions. And to be more quantitative here, what I'm showing this plot is the translation error, so the lower the better, versus outlier rates. And you can see that the outlier rates here are uh, 95%, 99%. These are really extreme problems. And you can see that uh, the algorithms that we propose, which are called TSER++ and TSER, have the lowest error, which is in the order of centimeters, even at 99% of outliers. And you can just take a look at the other techniques we compare against. So we compare against the Ransack 10K, which is Ransack after doing 10,000 iterations. And we do also outperform Ransack one minute, which is what you get if you run Ransack for an entire minute, which is something that you will never do in applications. And we largely beat essentially all this related work, including specialized techniques such as fast global registration. So I will not have time here to go to other results, but we have plenty of results which are really showing that uh, we can use TSER++ in uh, uh, realistic data sets with you know, deep learning correspondences, and uh, we can really have a huge boost with respect to RANSAC. And the other information here, which is quite important, is that uh, TSER++ is open source. You can go there, we have a very fast implementation in C++. So we'll move real quick to the second example, which is about image-based object localization. And here the setup is quite similar in the sense that, you know, again, we want to solve an outlier robust estimation. But in this case, what you are given is a 3D model of the object and a 2D projection potentially with the outliers. So this is the same setup that uh, Xiaowei was considering this morning and is leading essentially to a cost function which is uh, involved in some projection of 3D points to 2D images. I will go real quick through the math, but essentially the point here is that uh, this problem is complicated enough that we cannot use QCQP as in the case of TSER++ and we have to use a more powerful hammer, which is the hammer of polynomial optimization. I will not be able to tell you like much about the technical details, but the bottom line is that we use something that is called the Lasser hierarchy, which is essentially relaxing polynomial optimization problems. And we can still have results about when the solution of the convex relaxation is retrieving the solution of the original um, outlier robust estimation problem. Also in this case, we have empirical performance, which is extraordinary, like you know, the hierarchy produces tight relaxations, and also you can do a bunch of tricks to make the relaxation more tractable. In the last couple of minutes that I have, I just want to show you how powerful these techniques are. So these are results from, uh, uh, from uh, car detection, vehicle detection in images. And I'm comparing, for example, the number of baseline, including the one from uh, Costas and Xiaowei here, you know, Ransak, and the one that we propose. The one from Xiaowei is, is not a robust solver, so you know, that's fine, it's not able to reject outliers. Ransack is doing a slightly better job, and the proposed instead is just you know, spot on the car. And this is for a level of outliers, which is already pretty important, 70% of outliers. We compare techniques, including robust baselines against the proposed approach, which is called shape sharp. And you can see that uh, for 40% of outliers, all techniques are reasonable. You know, you can use baseline techniques and they are okay. But if you push for a large percentage of outliers, the other techniques are not able to figure out where is the car. Instead, shape sharp is spot on and is able to detect the car correctly. I have plenty of statistics to support that, but I would like to, to get at least a few questions. So maybe let's keep these. Really plenty of results supporting these techniques can make a difference in practice. Um, I want to conclude with a final part in which I want to, to get to the idea of fast certification. Is a really a single slide here. And the point is that the theory that I presented so far in this presentation is also, also allows checking the quality, the optimality of an estimate produced by another algorithm, for example, Ransack. And it turns out that verifying optimality is much faster than actually solving these polynomial optimization problems that I was talking about. So what we are doing recently is essentially to replace this idea of uh, SDP sum of squares, like, you know, relaxations, with the idea of uh, first running a fast solvers, like you know, graduated non-convexity or Ransack, and then performing fast verification. And these are really like enabling to perform and to execute these techniques in real time. 
For example, here I'm showing the time for uh, teaser plus plus and uh, compared to other techniques. And essentially you can see that you can execute teaser plus plus in 20 milliseconds on you know, realistic point clouds. Uh, and it's much faster than actually the other techniques. So spoiler, um, graduated non-convexity and this box here is going to be presented by my student Hank at uh, ICRA, his best paper finalist for, uh, for ICRA 2020. So we finish here. I will uh, thank all the sponsors supporting this work, including the Army Research Lab, uh, under DCIST, Lincoln Lab, and ONR. And I will thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Luca. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we're just gonna move on to the next speaker. And uh, Luca has been very active in chat answering questions. So if you guys could direct your questions to the chat, um, that help us keep on schedule. Cool. All right. Thank you guys. Oh, it's awkward because Roberto is the next person who's going to talk and he, he's the one that wants to, wants to ask the question. Um, I think, Luca, you're planning to be on for the afternoon, so hopefully you'll be able to ask it. All right. Uh, so let me go ahead and introduce, uh, introduce Roberto. So Roberto Tron is an assistant professor in the mechanical engineering department at Boston University. Um, after doing undergraduates in, in Italy, he came to the U.S., uh, studied at, at uh, Johns Hopkins and also at the GRASP lab. Um, being in the mechanical engineering department, he actually works across, he's not just doing perception, but he's at the intersection of control, robotics, computer vision. Um, so you can see he has kind of a broad perspective on how all these things tie, tie together in application. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Robert, Roberto. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, so today I want to talk about um, uh, distributed matching. So we have seen uh, many talks today uh, about matching. I um, I start with like reinforcing somewhat the themes we have seen from previous talks, and we'll see also um, uh, well, then uh, deviate a little bit and uh, move into uh, distributed how you can uh, perform uh, uh, this matching in a distributed setting. So um, the application I have in mind are of the, this kind. You have a bunch of robots uh, in an environment and they are tracking some object. And uh, you want to make sure that whenever robot one says, uh, I'm seeing a, a car here, uh, and robot two says, I'm seeing a car here, they need to be sure that they are actually the same car so that they can fuse their uh, estimates and then track the movement of this uh, car. The, uh, the idea behind this talk is to, uh, I want you to convey two main um, ideas. The first one is about consistent matches, which is sort of was covered already in uh, many different talks in, uh, today. And um, also how to distribute this computation of these consistent matches. And the keywords uh, that I behind uh, this talk are clustering for uh, obtaining consistent matches and distributed hashing for distributing computation. So to begin, um, this is a picture that you have seen before. You have uh, many different, uh, uh, you have different views of the same object from different cameras, and you want to identify uh, what is the in each picture, and you want to identify uh, what point in one image corresponds to another point in another image. So the first step is to extract features, see or deep features. And then uh, the traditional approach, or at least traditional uh, up to um, a few years ago, was to do pairwise matching. Uh, and so you start with, for instance, trying to match this image to this image. You do a pretty good job. You try to match this image to this image, and you do a pretty good job. Then you try to um, um, do matching between the last two images, and you start seeing a problem because you have a logical inconsistency. If you start from this match, you, you match to this point in this figure, in this image, then you match to this point in this figure, but this doesn't close the loop, uh, doesn't close the cycle. So these matches are consistent. What we are really want, want to do is to have consistent matching, meaning that no matter what cycle we do in the, this graph of correspondences, we'll always get logically consistent uh, matches. And uh, this uh, idea of finding uh, 
matches that are consistent, it's actually you can see the problem in different ways. And this is um, something I um, uh, studied in a, uh, our ICCB paper in 2017. So the first is just uh, adopting a graph interpretation. So you have this graph of correspondences and pairwise matches. And uh, matching becomes consistent if you can find clicks in uh, your graph. So essentially, every point needs to match to every other point if it's seen in uh, other images. And so this translates to have disjoint click a graph, which is just a union of disjoint clicks. However, if you extract these features and uh, try to compute some sort of similarity between uh, these features, so these features should match, so they should be very similar. And so if you plot the simili uh, block simili uh, similarity matrix, you see that presents uh, a typical block structure. And if you are uh, familiar with clustering, this is exactly the kind of similarity matrix that you will expect to see in a clustering problem. And in fact, the last uh, interpretation um, that we use, uh, I use in this work is to actually see this problem not as finding mm, consistent matches, but really finding clusters of features that are uh, internally consistent. And this interpretation, so the first interpretation, we, you can, uh, it can be shown that it's equivalent to requiring cycle consistency that we've seen in, in other talks. And uh, in uh, the, um, uh, the cluster interpretation is consistent with the universe interpretation where each cluster represents one and only one uh, point in the universe. And uh, you're trying to identify these points and their correspondence in the images. So theoretically, they are all the same problem. However, they present these different interpretation uh, um, allow different ways to attack the problem. So uh, going back to um, uh, doing consistent matching by construction, this is our problem. So we transform this, as I said, we transform this problem from going into the problem of finding cycles that are consistent to finding clusters of similar features. So in one part of the feature space, you'll have all images of the front of the car, for instance, or the back of the car or the other wheel of the car, because they should all, since they all correspond the, to the same point, if the descriptors are uh, do their job, then they usually get similar features. However, from uh, um, like a classical clustering problem, we have here an additional clue on how to find these clusters is that in, when you look at the same image, by um, uh, it's pretty it, um, clear that you cannot match two points in the same image because that will correspond clearly to two different points in the universe. And so what you can do is to get uh, compute the distance in the feature space between points that are in the same image, between features that are in the same image. And this gives you an idea of like how big can, can the cluster be. If there, if you, uh, in general in a clustering problem, you don't have any idea of like how big the clusters are. However, in this case, we, by looking at similar features in the same image, we can get an idea of these uh, dimensions of the cluster. And we'll use this uh, in a, our algorithm in a couple of slides. So as I said, there are different approaches and uh, to solve this multi uh, multi match problem, and uh, uh, I won't discuss uh, the approaches that the previous talk have done a better job uh, covering. Uh, what I point here is that so we said this is a, a problem equivalent to a, a clustering problem, and so what we can do we can apply clustering algorithms. And in particular, what we use are density-based clustering algorithms, such as mean shift, quick shift, or the discount. So this, the overall uh, algorithm, on the left are the, all the steps of the algorithm, which we call quick match. So we start with the data, then we perform scale estimation. So by looking at the distance between uh, points that are come from the same image, so here, same color means same image, we can give an estimate of how big the clusters are for each point. Then what we use these densities, uh, these scales to perform density estimation. So imagine you have a bucket of sand for each one of these points. 
and you drop the socket, uh, the amount of sand, it depends on the scale you estimated, and you drop the sand on each one of these points. What happens is, is the sand will accumulate uh, in this feature space, and ideally the peaks in this density, the amount of sand, will tell you where the clusters are. So this is the idea behind uh, density-based clustering. So how do you pass from the density to actual uh, finding the clusters? What you do, you first order all the uh, points in a tree. So for each point, you look at the closest point that gives you an increase in density. So for instance, from here, I'll jump to this peak here. Then from this peak, I'll jump to another peak here and so on. And so what you see here is that you'll see a tree where you have very short edges inside each cluster. And then you have uh, these additional spurious edges that are very long with respect to the scale of the points and uh, that connect different uh, trees in different clusters. And so once you order all the points in a tree, you can try to go from the bottom up and try to identify which edges are long with respect to edges in the orange uh, uh, cluster. And so then you can break the tree and then you can obtain your cluster just by looking to the, uh, the trees that are in uh, this forest. And uh, we call this uh, algorithm quick match. And it's very fast, very low memory. Uh, essentially, you can compute it in linear time uh, with respect to the number of features, uh, both in terms of computation and uh, memory. Um, but, um, and, but it's greedy. Uh, however, we wanted to see, okay, this is nice for like uh, computing uh, associations. How does this translate in actual performance? So for this, we used an um, algorithm, which is um, we applied uh, this into um, a, uh, a tracking application where we are looking to uh, find the position of the car. So we use homography estimation to find the position of the car from each image. And we then use Kalman filtering to fuse the estimates. And on the left is that traditional pairwise matching. On the right, it's a quick match. You see that in general, the estimates are much more closer to the true trajectory. There are still some outliers, but are much less. So passing to the distributed part, the standard approach is to just send everything to a central node or send all the, all the, your data to all the nodes and perform the same computation in parallel. So the first approach is not robust. What if the central node fails? The second one, you repeat lots of computations. So instead, what we, are, we thought is to use an idea from uh, computer science, which is distributed hash tables, where you distribute when you need to communicate in the network, you, and you are interested to retrieve some specific amount of uh, some specific datum. You don't order the network in terms of IP addresses. However, you take your data and say, I want to know another node that contains the word fox, a uh, phrase with uh, the word fox. You pass this, uh, this into an hash function. This hash function tells you an address in your network, and then you can contact that node to retrieve uh, any information you have about foxes, for instance. So how this translates in our problem? So we call this algorithm net match. And again, on the left are the steps. We start as before, the points that should sort of cluster in the feature space. The first thing we do is partition the feature space. So this partition can be data driven or in theory could be any partition you can pick. The most convenient way is just to pick some root nodes and this in uh, defines a Voronoi partition where each element is all the points that are closest to a given um, uh, to a given uh, root point. Then you perform hashing, which means an email, a camera will collect some features. We look what fe uh, how do this feature look, and we'll try to match. So, for instance, this feature is closest to this root, and so we'll send it to this camera. So you assign one root for each camera. And so each camera, when I uh, receive a, a detects a feature, will send that feature to the camera with the closest root. What happens then if like for a given camera, it will receive all the points that are closest to the its own root. 
And so this is sort of like a pre-clustering um, step. And then what you can do is responsible for different uh, element of the partition. And so it can run a local quick match or any local uh, clustering algorithm. And will, uh, it can, so they can perform uh, the clustering, meaning finding the consistent features. And then they can send back the results to all the other cameras. In this way, each feature is just sent once through the network. And so you essentially you cannot um, get any better than that. Um, however, there are uh, some problems when uh, you have um, cluster that straddle the boundaries of the partition, uh, you may have already into. Uh, so for instance, here, there is a cluster in the middle, which is split across all the partition. How can we uh, avoid this situation? What we do is to avoid uh, this much errors is to in, um, introduce the um, notion of contested uh, features. And so if you see a feature which is closest to the boundary, then the local clustering, uh, the local, uh, the size of the local cluster, then you communicate with your neighbors in the partition and you decide if it really this point is so much closer, then you just send all the points that are in this cluster to the uh, next node so that you uh, avoid like uh, splitting this cluster. So you re merge the cluster that were contested. So to give you an idea, you can uh, repeat these multiple rounds. So for instance, all these points that are close gets passed to uh, neighbors. And so and again, you uh, still have some that are contested. But by the end, you don't have like a clear partition which to respect the boundary boundaries, but you merge different uh, clusters that are uh, uh, that were studying different boundaries. And um, we implemented this. And uh, again, the same application, the, third, the top two results are uh, what we, uh, I showed you just before, uh, the pairwise matching the centralized quick match. The bottom left is net match without the second step of resolving the contested features. And the last step is a full net match with, uh, with resolving the contested features. <coughs> you can see that uh, we get similar results between a quick match and net match. Net match performs a little worse uh, due to the fact that yes, the resolution of um, uh, contested features uh, works, improves the results, but it's still not enough to get a centralized equivalent result. And so uh, to give a comparison, this uh, histogram of the localization errors across all algorithms, quick match performs the best, centralized quick match performs the best, even then like uh, pairwise, any pairwise um, algorithm uh, that we tested in on this data set. Net match, it's slightly worse then um, uh, a pair, a centralized pairwise uh, algorithm, but really this minimizes the amount of communication you do in the network. <clears throat> and so this sort of gives you an idea that quick match gives you the best performance and with and match you still get good performance and very low communication, but it's not as quite, we were still working on trying to make it as good as the centralized version. So to uh, conclude my talk, uh, we, I presented quick match and net match. So the first one is a method for multi-image matching, and it's based on density-based uh, clustering. And then I present a net match, which is based on the idea of uh, using uh, ideas from distributed hash tables uh, to minimize the number of um, communication that you need to make. And plus some refinements to uh, solve some of the problem introduced by the partition of the feature space. Uh, in the spirit of this um, uh, workshop, what are the challenges and operator direction I see in this field? So quick match, I say this fast but greedy. So once you create the tree, you never go back to um, uh, fix any mistake you may have made. And so you, the, idea, the idea is that other approaches that use a non, uh, iterative or spectral refinement, as those that we have seen before, uh, don't have this problem. 
But however, they don't use this idea of density-based clustering, which works very well for quick match. So is there a way to combine them? Uh, again, as a question I posed before, can we include uh, 3D geometry information uh, if people are constrained? And higher order, that introduces higher order relation between features. And uh, there are learnable features that we have seen in other talks. Uh, there is lots of promising work, but they have not been applied to this setting of like distributed uh, matching. Um, and also there is an underlying problem with all this, uh, where you have many features, but every feature seen only for a few views becomes a very hard um, uh, problem for any algorithm. And with this, I want to say thanks to my students, my collaborator and the funding edges. Thank you. All right, thanks, Roberto. Um, so we'll defer questions to the chat with Roberto. Uh, in, in the uh, interest of time, we'll move on to Randall Beard. All right, so uh, Randall is a professor on electrical engineering at Brigham Young University in Utah in the US. Uh, he's worked at a lot of different places, <laughs> Jet Propulsion Labs, Air Force Research Labs, uh, held a visiting position in INRIA. Um, so Randall has a deep background in controls, uh, particularly in the, the aerial vehicles and unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, so to that end, he's doing a lot of stuff on vision-based navigation, guidance and control of, of UAVs, multiple target tracking. Uh, so he's coming to us with a perspective from that community. All right, so without further ado, uh, Randall, the floor is yours. Great, can everybody hear me and see my videos or see my slides? Uh, yes, your screen is showing. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's uh, this has been a great workshop. I want to thank the organizers. I've uh, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I want to talk about tracking uh, moving objects from a moving camera. In particular, I'm thinking about uh, UAVs that might be moving in 3D environments that are uh, relatively close to the scene. So, oh, I'm having technical problems. Sorry. Uh, my slide doesn't seem to be advancing. Oh, okay. Uh, does it say motivation at the top right now? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay, so um, if we're, uh, you know, again, tracking moving targets uh, from a camera uh, requires that uh, those moving targets be identified in the image. If the image is moving, uh, or if the camera is moving, then it becomes a lot more challenging, and particularly if you're in, uh, you know, close 3D scenes like, uh, like this, uh, uh, this environment that I'm showing here. Uh, because of parallax, you know, uh, objects in the environment, uh, corners in the building will start to look like uh, moving objects. So uh, we're, the framework that we're using uh, to attack this problem is, uh, we're calling it this uh, multiple target tracking uh, architecture. Basically, we've got a camera mounted on a UAV. We do uh, KLT feature tracking, and then uh, that produces feature pairs. Then we then do a segmentation uh, step where we decide, okay, what is moving, what is not moving. We uh, 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 then pass all of the, the uh, feature pairs that come from moving targets into an algorithm uh, called the recursive ransack uh, tracking algorithm that I'll describe uh, very briefly. And then uh, we may do other things with that, for example, uh, geolocation. So I'm gonna talk uh, uh, the first, um, maybe third of the presentation, I'll talk uh, about this uh, uh, multiple target tracking uh, framework that we use, uh, in particular this recursive ransack uh, uh, algorithm, and then um, how do we do uh, in the past, how have we been doing moving target indication, and then uh, some of the limitations. And then I'll talk about um, <clears throat> kind of our solution there, uh, uh, which uh, we, we use a relative pose estimation algorithm based on epipolar geometry um, and LMEDS filtering. And that allows us to uh, pull out moving targets from these close 3D scenes. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, applications of that to multiple target tracking in 3D environments. So, um, I don't know why my, okay, let me try this again. Okay, so this recursive ransack algorithm, uh, this is an algorithm that we developed a number of uh, years ago, uh, four or five years ago, it uh, perform performs fast random searches to find potential tracks in the, uh, in the environment, uh, produces many potential tracks and keeps around those that are most consistent with the data. 
There's a very fast data association mechanism uh, that I'll uh, describe briefly. And you get uh, excellent track continuity compared to uh, other methods. And it tends to be uh, uh, quite robust to cluttered environment. So this slide uh, is basically a one slide overview of what this algorithm is. Uh, so uh, suppose that you have uh, data that is, uh, that's been collected over time. So for example, at the last time step, you might have a couple of features that uh, were in the image. At the time step before that, you've got data points, et cetera, going backwards in time. And, and of course, you know, at some time step, you may have received, uh, you know, there's lots of outlier data. So what the uh, recursive ransack algorithm does is essentially randomly selects data points going backwards in time and then fits a uh, linear uh, time invariant model or a track to the uh, to past randomly selected data and the currently uh, a current measurement. So every time we receive a measurement, um, if the measurement is not consistent with any current tracks, then we basically, uh, you know, uh, randomly select points backwards in time, fit a uh, model using uh, maximum uh, likelihood uh, estimation, and we may be able to find, you know, using a, a ransack process, we may be able to find multiple tracks uh, that are consistent with that data. But over time, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll essentially uh, only keep those tracks that remain consistent with measurements that we can uh, continue to receive. And so essentially we have uh, this bank of models. Uh, each model represents a, a track in the environment or a, tr a track uh, in the scene. And uh, uh, if, I guess if we, you know, when we receive a new measurement, if that measurement is consistent with any of these tracks in the model, then we go ahead and update the model. Um, if it's uh, consistent with multiple models, then we do a uh, probabilistic data association to uh, to update each of the models that it's consistent with. And if it's not consistent with any model, then we uh, use this ransack process to generate a new model uh, that's consistent with past data and the current measurement that we receive. Okay, so that's uh, basically the track management data association piece that we have um, at the front end is uh, something we call this visual front end. And it generates uh, data points that then go into this tracking algorithm. So just an overview of uh, how we do this front end at, at the beginning, we do uh, good features to track and uh, you know, a KLT uh, a feature tracker. We then take um, all of the matching pairs and uh, use, you know, uh, estimate a homography between um, the different images uh, and all of the outliers uh, to that homography generation are flagged as potentially moving objects. So, uh, and again, this is, uh, you know, you have to do a five point uh, homography estimation uh, to, to do this. And so all of the outlier measurements, we then feed into a, a, this recursive ransack algorithm to produce tracks. So we do KLT tracking, we use the homography to uh, indicate anything that might be moving. We then take those moving features and, uh, and feed them into this recursive ransack algorithm to, uh, to track. So this is uh, what we call a visual MTT. Uh, and if you take, if you use this algorithm on data that is collected, um, you know, from a UAV from a, uh, on a scene that is either mostly planar or the UAV motion is mostly rotational, then it does a pretty good job. This is uh, obviously where the homography uh, matrix does a good job of estimating uh, the pose or the um, uh, ego motion of the vehicle. However, if you try this uh, with a UAV uh, that is both translating and rotating and where you don't have a planar scene, uh, what happens is, see in the trees here, we end up with a lot of, uh, of tracks that get generated. So these things start to look like, you know, over time, uh, we may have uh, persistent motion that begins to look like a moving track in the, in the scene as if it were coming from a, a planar environment. And so how do we, uh, you know, as we're flying around, uh, you know, in these close 3D environments, how do we indicate uh, or find, uh, you know, things that truly are moving and then separate those from things that are moving just due to parallax. So that brings me to the, um, and this relative pose estimation algorithm. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the basic idea is that we're gonna segment 
based on epipolar geometry. So uh, anything that's stationary, any world points in the environment that are stationary will move along epipolar lines as, uh, as the camera translates and rotates. And we can, uh, of course, approximate that uh, from the essential matrix. And so we basically flag any features that deviate from epipolar lines by some threshold and pass those to this recursive uh, ransack algorithm. So just to remind you, the essential matrix is composed of the, uh, the rotation between uh, poses and also the, uh, the, the relative translation uh, that's normalized. And then uh, anything that satisfy, you know, fe matching feature pairs uh, that satisfy this uh, epipolar constraint, um, uh, or I guess satisfy this constraint uh, uh, are features that move along those epipolar lines. Okay, so how do you estimate the, uh, <clears throat> the essential matrix? So there's a couple of algorithms that are available, for example, in OpenCV. So we've got the, uh, the eight point algorithm where you have eight matching pairs, uh, you form a linear problem in E, you do an SVD, it uses ransack then to go through and find these minimum subsets of eight fe uh, matching features. Or you could use the five point algorithm. Uh, it's also available say in OpenCV and it has uh, five matching pairs. It forms a 10th order polynomial. Each route's a possible solution. So you have to, you find the real roots and then you have to do a geometric uh, <clears throat> constraint uh, to see which of the roots is actually the one that satisfies uh, you know, all of the constraints. And again, you use a ransack process to generate minimum subsets using five matching features. So after you do that, then you can decompose an essential matrix into the relative pose. Uh, and doing both of these require, you know, both of these five point or eight point algorithms require uh, using ransack or maybe, uh, you know, LMEDs to uh, do, uh, uh, to reject outliers. And the disadvantage here is that this, uh, using an eight point uh, ransack algorithm or a five point out ransack algorithm, you have to do a lot of, of hypotheses. And also uh, with a, a flying vehicle, we have an IMU. Uh, it's not obvious how to use the IMU to assist in estimating uh, the motion. So we have this uh, new approach that we've come up with for, uh, for doing pose estimation. Um, again, we're doing KLT feature tracking that gets passed into our algorithm. <clears throat> and essentially we're doing a one point uh, ransack um, process uh, or, or even uh, if you have time, you could do all matching features, I suppose, uh, because it's a one point algorithm. Uh, and we trade off uh, one point for essentially seeding this algorithm with a good uh, initial guess. And then we do this LM optimization, uh, we score the solution and uh, use the best hypothesis and go back to one point. So essentially we're, we're doing an optimization on one, one point at a time, uh, making sure that, uh, uh, that the score, I guess, uh, decreases at each point and then we you know we use the best hypothesis and we can seed this thing with IMU prediction and then use it for other things uh, as well. Okay so the LM optimization what is the residual that we're using? So you've got the epipolar constraint um, so this is uh, relatively uh, uh, standard stuff uh, so you want this to be zero and it turns out that for noisy data it's better to use the uh, the Samson error that that minimizes, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess, the normalized uh, epipolar constraint. Okay, so how do we, uh, uh, in terms of parameterization uh, for this algorithm, uh, so remember the essential matrix is composed of a, uh, a unit vector for translation and then rotation, and so we parameterize the unit vector actually with another uh, rotation matrix, and we essentially can get the essential matrix in terms of, uh, of two uh, rotation matrices. So our residual for any matching pair uh, in terms of R and Q. And then when we do the levin burden quart uh, optimization, uh, we do on manifold uh, steps uh, to make sure that we've always got a, a good uh, rotation translation. And then in terms of scoring, um, the way we score this algorithm, or we score solutions are based on the uh, uh, least me medium squares. So you look at the medium, uh, 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 residual uh, over all feature matches. Uh, and this will, of course, assume in terms of limitations, this assumes that at least half of the matching pairs, the feature pairs, are both correct feature matches and correspond to 
uh, stationary points. So cases where, where that's not uh, true, this, this method would fail. Okay, Ellen, in terms of uh, seeding this algorithm, so if the IMU is available, then you, um, you seed the first LM iteration with an IMU prediction. So really, uh, we're trading off, you know, we, we get away with a one-point ransack algorithm uh, by seeding the algorithm with a good initial guess and then exploiting the fact that for UAV motion, um, we're not undergoing large uh, rotations and translations from step to step. Uh, if you don't have the IMU, then you can seed uh, the, uh, the algorithm with uh, um, you know, the best hypothesis from the previous time step, uh, uh, I guess, uh, with the assumption that um, uh, if it was a constant uh, angular rotation, constant velocity of the, of the vehicle or the camera between uh, frames, that uh, that gives you a first uh, or at least a good initial guess. And there may be other ways of uh, doing the seeding here. Um, maybe exploiting some of the uh, cycle consistency stuff that we've seen uh, in the workshop. And then uh, every subsequent LM iteration between frames is, uh, is just seeded with the current best hypothesis. Okay, so if you, uh, if you look at convergence time uh, of this method that uh, I'm talking about, uh, it turns out it actually converges uh, quite fast. This is the um, OpenCV NISTERS algorithm using um, you know, a five-point uh, ransack uh, process. So we actually get uh, convergence, and uh, we're comparing it uh, uh, always to the LMEDS error. Um, in terms of computation time, um, you know, of course, uh, this uh, NISTERS algorithm uses a lot of time in hypothesis generation and hy hypothesis scoring, where we spend much less time doing that. So we're almost an order of magnitude less in terms of uh, computation time. So again, uh, camera features, uh, we do this one point, uh, you know, so at every point we're only optimizing over, over one feature pair. Uh, we score that over all features and then keep the, uh, the best hypothesis. We seed that with IMU uh, prediction. And uh, at the very beginning, we have to do pose refinement and disambiguation. We do that every step uh, because it's relatively inexpensive. So in terms of uh, application to uh, multiple target tracking, so again, the application's uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, when the features, uh, you know, any features that are moving uh, in the environment uh, will not move along epipolar lines. And so we basically uh, have a threshold that says, you know, if we're not moving along the, uh, or we have uh, some deviation from the epipolar line, then we flag that as a possible uh, feature uh, that it comes from a moving uh, target. And then we feed that into the recursive ransack algorithm that does outlier rejections because there'll be many outliers when we do this. So this is a video that, um, and it's actually a couple, uh, it's a little bit old, but uh, we have uh, again a, a quad rotor that's flying around. There's all these light posts and uh, trees in the, in the, uh, scene and corners of buildings. So this, uh, you know, uh, at least using our other method, you know, these things all generated tracks because they look like features that were moving in the environment uh, relative to say a planar scene. But, uh, you know, we're able to um, basically reject all those and track uh, things in the environment that truly are moving. Okay, computation time, this is all based on a uh, uh, Jetson TX2. Uh, most of the computation time actually is spent doing uh, uh, the KLT tracker. Uh, our pose estimation algorithm is, uh, is pretty fast. Uh, the recursive ransack algorithm, so th this is, uh, you know, we have 30 um, uh, Kalman filter tracks that are being maintained, and then uh, it's doing the uh, uh, data association, et cetera, inside of here. And then, then we have a bunch of track management and things that are happening. Uh, but we're able to do about 30 frames a second on 640 by 480 uh, images. Okay, so um, I overviewed, you know, our recently introduced, recently maybe in the last four or five years, this uh, visual multiple target tracking algorithm. Um, we introduced now a new method for segmenting moving and non-moving uh, points. It uses a one-point 
uh, ransack iteration. Uh, it directly estimates the relative post. It could be used for other things uh, in addition to just, uh, um, you know, moving, moving target indicator, I guess. Um, and it exploits the fact that there's a small relative motion between uh, frames for typical UAV uh, video. And it exploits IMU if it's available. And it's really an alternative uh, to frame to frame estimation of the essential matrix using you know, a five or eight point algorithm. And then we showed some application to tracking moving targets with the caveat that this, it would be blind to any kind of motion along epipolar lines. And uh, with that, I'm, I don't know if I have time for questions, but if so, I'm happy to take some. Uh, we'll have to defer the questions to chat or you can reach out to Randy uh, by his email, he and his students. Um, thanks a lot, Randy. You bet. Um, so we're gonna continue next with uh, Nikolai Atanasov. Uh, Nikolai is an assistant professor on uh, electrical engineering department at the University of California in San Diego. Um, he's coming from a robotics background, having worked at the, the GRASP lab. So doing robotics, control theory, machine learning. Um, and he's, he's interested in problems that span across both ground and aerial vehicles operating at the same time. I think he, has a lot, of, a lot of successful publications. His uh, he won a best dissertation award um, for his dissertation in 2015, and also a best paper award at ICRA in 2017, which I believe was the work uh, along with Costas that sort of re reinvigorated or uh, reminded the robotics community at large that SLAM was still an interesting problem. So thank you for that. All right. Without further ado, uh, hand it over to you, Nikolai. Thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, can you see my slides and hear me well? Yes, you are. I really appreciate the invitation. And I, I, I want to say that this has been a really exciting workshop so far. Uh, I, I learned a lot and, and I see a lot of connections with uh, the work we've been doing. So uh, I am at University of California, San Diego, uh, part of the Contextual Robotics Institute there. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how does data association enter into geometric and semantic slam. So, so continuing on a team that we've uh, seen throughout several uh, talks. So uh, I, I want to start with a quick motivation, but I think by now we are all convinced that uh, thinking about objects and organizing the uh, world uh, as a collection of objects is, is a, a, a good uh, thing to strive for. Uh, and when it comes to geometric uh, SLAM using uh, orb features and SIF features and so on, we've already seen very, very impressive results in, in crowded scenarios. This is an example from the Google uh, project Tango and, and there's been a lot of exciting work, but this work has mostly uh, used uh, geometry and, and doesn't take advantage of the recent very exciting progress in uh, computer vision and using convolutional neural networks to do object detection, segmentation, tracking, the really exciting results. Uh, so our focus has been on kind of uh, connecting those two worlds together and, and thinking about doing localization and mapping it uh, at the level of objects. And again, object maps are, are exciting for a number of reasons. They're uh, easy to understand, they're compressed representation, uh, they can be used to specify interesting uh, missions for, for the robots in terms of uh, uh, objects, uh, the, they help with loop closure and perceptual aliasing uh, and, and so on. So, so here's a quick overview of some of the work uh, we've been doing. Uh, our focus has been on tracking the trajectory of a camera and an IMU, uh, or, or if you have multiple sensors, that's, that's even better. And at the same time, detecting objects in, in the world and estimating also their positions, orientations, classes, shape, uh, and so on. So this example shows uh, kind of detection of two types of chairs and uh, building a map of, uh, of chairs in an indoor environment. So uh, after uh, this, we get a, a, a map that looks something like this. So I'm going to try to uh, give you a, a little bit of what's going on in, in this uh, algorithm and highlight specifically uh, the areas where we connect to outliers and uh, data association. So in, in this formulation of SLAM, I'm, I'm going to distinguish between metric information. So those are visual features like orb and sift and intensity based measurements and inertial data. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm assuming we have this semantic information, which I'm going to highlight in a second. So this is things like object detection, object parts and segmentation and uh, data association plays an important role uh, in, in this problem. So, so let's understand each of these parts. So, so the first step, as I said, is, is, is standard to have IMU and geometric features. So I'm not going to spend time on this. Uh, 
when it comes to what I call semantic information is we have these images over time and we can uh, use neural networks to detect a number of, uh, of things such as a bounding box for the object, but also some uh, more precise information such as object parts. So we might have these semantic features such as uh, wheels and windshield and doors. And, and, and this was a uh, very exciting work by uh, Xiao Wei Zhou uh, and, and Costas Danielis' group uh, early on. Uh, and then more recently, now we can even do semantic segmentation, which gives us uh, uh, features and, and an outline for, for the uh, uh, object. So here are more examples of these semantic key points and uh, semantic segmentation. So the objective is we want to track the trajectory of the sensor over time, and we want to build uh, this map of object positions and shapes and uh, orientations uh, and so on. So, so data association plays a very important role here. In particular, uh, observation n at time t is, is an object m is, is kind of a problem we need to repeatedly answer. Is, is that the case or not? And in, in practice, this is not known. So, so I see all of these uh, objects around, doors and chairs, and I have a map of many doors and many chairs, and I don't exactly know which door and which chair I saw. In some situations, if you have a good estimate of your vehicle's poles, you, you can reduce the number of objects you need to distinguish between. But in an extreme situation where we even do the kidnapped robot problem, I put you in, a, in an environment you've, uh, uh, you have a map of, but you don't know where you are, you, you have this problem at, a, at an extreme. So what is the typical approach to, to handling this uh, data association problem? Well, uh, in, uh, in practice or in a lot of the, um, uh, sorry about that. So, so in, in a lot of the previous presentations as well, what we saw is, is, is first we try to solve this data association problem. So, so we are uh, given an initial estimate of the vehicle poles, maybe an initial guess of, of, what, of where the objects are. Uh, we try to first do this matching between the observed objects and, uh, and, the, and, the, and their detections, which I'm denoting S here, the semantic observations. We first try to estimate the data association. And then given this data association estimate, we perform a, an optimization over the sensor trajectory and the, uh, and the objects. So uh, if you look at this from an optimization point of view, this very much looks like a joint problem, which is split into two parts. Uh, it looks almost like coordinate descent on, on, a, on, a, on a joint objective in which you first optimize data association, and then you optimize the sensor poses and, and objects. So instead of doing this hard split in our work, we've, uh, we've observed that uh, you can actually treat this as a uh, the, the data association is really a latent variable. I don't, I don't care about it at the end. I don't need to know this association. It's, it's, it's a thing that I need in order to estimate my trajectory and, and object states. In the end, I want to have this map and the objects and the data association is really a latent variable. So, so we've looked at this as a, a kind of maximizing the expectation over the uh, data association of the uh, log likelihood of the semantic uh, observations. So looking at this problem, uh, we can approach this. So now it looks very much like the objective function of the expectation maximization algorithm. So, so we've uh, uh, discovered that you can instead think about first estimating a distribution over the data association. In particular, I'm going to define this variable W here, which at time t tells me what is the probability that observation n is associated with object m and I'm going to clarify all these uh, details uh, a little later. And then given this data association, uh, now, we, now we can, if we think of this as a, as a factor graph or as an estimation problem, now I know which nodes in my graph to connect in order to do the uh, estimation over the uh, sensor poses and the object poses. So, so I get something like a weighted uh, nonlinear least squares problem, which we can use uh, standard algorithms to, to solve once we have these weights. So really one of the challenges is, is where do you get these weights and, and what do they mean? So I'm going to give you more details about both of these uh, uh, steps. So we have the E step, which is estimating the distribution over the data association, and the M step, which is optimizing the uh, sensor pause and the object pauses. So I'll talk about both to, to give you uh, a sense of what we've done in, in, in our work. So, so first about the M step. So for now, I'm going to assume that data association is given or, or, or known and focus a little bit on the sensor and object representations. So the sensor state in, 
usually consists of the IMU, which involves position, orientation, velocity, bias, and so on. And we have the camera state is the is the pose of the camera or maybe a history uh, of that. that that's a, a fairly standard thing. Um, so uh, some more interesting things, uh, things become more interesting when we start thinking about objects. So in, in addition to the usual uh, acceleration and angular velocity measurements from an IMU and the geometric features, uh, which are the green points over here. Now we're going to assume that we have a lot more uh, information from uh, from uh, the vision, so we can recognize these object semantic key points, which again are like the wheels and windshield and doors uh, on the car. Or maybe we have a segmentation mask here, which also has convolutional features of the object, and we might have a bounding box uh, for the object. So these are the observations. Uh, we have, and then we need one more thing. What is the object? How do we define an object and how do we represent it? Um, so this is very close to uh, what uh, uh, Nick Roy mentioned in his presentation. Uh, we don't want to represent objects with a single point because we cannot capture or we cannot relate this single point to a lot of this information. So ideally we want a representation that doesn't take too many uh, parameters. So it's uh, easy to optimize. Uh, but it is expressive enough to, to connect to the visual observations we have. Uh, so in, we've started with uh, uh, simple representations based on the locations of these semantic uh, landmarks in 3D. So we have a collection of these uh, points on the object and uh, as well as something like the coarse shape of the object. So we've also looked at ellipsoid based models or a, or a mesh with fixed faces where we optimize the vertices uh, and uh, we distinguish between an object category. So this is something like the average mean shape of let's say a car or a chair or a table versus an object instance, which in addition has its specific pose in, in the world frame and has some deformations to this average shape. So an, a car looks like this on average, but when I see a BMW versus Mercedes versus a van, I get deformations on these, uh, on these features. So I'm going to come back to this object state uh, idea because I think it's really important what kind of representation you use for your object in, in achieving the, the goal of having both compressed but an expressive uh, representation of the, of the map. So having defined the observations, the object state and the uh, sensor state, we, we go to uh, formulating an optimization problem. So we have a bunch of these error terms, one associated with each of the observations. So we have inertial error, geometric key point error, semantic key point error, maybe semantic mask error and bounding box. So, so all of these, depending on your object representation can be defined uh, uh, precisely. So for example, if your object is an ellipsoid, you can project this to the 2D image and expect that the bounding box lines are tangent to this uh, uh, conic projection. So this is similar to what uh, Nick Roy was mentioning earlier. If we have a mesh, we can think about projection of the mesh to the image and then you expect that the semantic mask and the mesh projection uh, are uh, have a good uh, overlap or maybe an intersection over union uh, uh, measure is in order. So in our work we've proposed kind of mathematical expressions for all of these uh, uh, errors and I have some references here on the bottom and uh, a lot of them involve poses, positions and orientations. So when you're uh, computing the Jacobians of these things you should also be uh, careful about uh, doing this on the SE3 uh, manifold. Uh, maybe I'll highlight one interesting thing is how do you make sure that the mesh projection to the to the image is differentiable? Uh, well, there there has been a sequence of very exciting works at CVPR. Uh, I think I believe maybe the first one was the Neuro 3D Mesh Renderer in 2018, which showed that we can do differentiable uh, mesh rasterization. So um, so. If we have the data association, we can formulate this uh, big nonlinear least squares problem. Here are all the terms. Uh, we can solve it and, and estimate the positions of the uh, sensor and the uh, objects. How about the data association? So going back to the E step, the question I asked there is, uh, we want to compute these weights, which tell us what is the likelihood of associating an observation N at time T to an object N. So we're back to this, uh, uh, situation where, okay, I, I, I have a number of objects around me or, or from my map and I've detected a, a few objects and now I want to see what is the probability of this association. So let's say I link this chair to this chair. 
what is the probability that this is a correct association? Well, the other objects I have on my image have to be associated somehow, and we need to check if this is actually uh, consistent. So we can think of this as the nodes of a bar bipartite graph. So on the one hand, I have the uh, objects in my image view. On the other hand, I have the objects in the, uh, in the world view. Uh, uh, and think about these possible associations as really matchings in a bipartite graph. So I, I have different ways of associating these things. So I can associate observation one with object one, and this has a certain likelihood depending on my observation model. So, so this comes essentially exactly from the error terms I, I defined earlier. We can define a likelihood which is proportional to the exponential of the negative error. So this will give me the weights in these possible matchings. And depending on how I assign the different objects, I'm going to get different weights. Um, so what are we trying to compute here? Well, we're trying to find, again, the probability that observation n at time t is from object m. Uh, and uh, it, this is, so object n and, uh, sorry, observation n and object m are associated, but the other objects in this view uh, can, can be associated in a number of different ways. So I'm going to use this script uh, d here to denote the possible permutations be, be among the associations for the other objects. And then given the data association from one of these uh, permutations, then, then we can assume that the objects and observations are uh, independent of each other. Uh, so, so we have the product of the observation uh, models over here. So how do we compute this term uh, efficiently? So, so this is a term that shows up. So even if I split things at the image at time t, uh, this uh, term shows up, but in a more extreme formulation, I can even think about this doing this over all the time. So I have all observations, all objects. I would have a, a single sum here over all possible uh, associations and a product over the likelihoods for the for the different objects. So how do we solve this term efficiently? Um, so so a, a very nice observation we, we've made is that this, if you look at this sum over permutations of a product of likelihoods, this very much looks like the permanent of a matrix. So, so let me remind you what is the permanent. So the permanent is, is very similar to a uh, determinant, uh, but uh, instead of doing the cofactors in the determinant with uh, positive and negative signs, uh, we, we only add cofactors. So for example, in a three by three matrix, I would pick the first element, compute the uh, determinant of the sub matrix here, and then keep going along the, the row, adding the terms. And uh, this, uh, this would give me an estimate of the permanent of the matrix, which is exactly the computation we wanted to do, the sum over the products of the likelihoods. So how hard is it to compute these permanents? Well, uh, it is uh, actually not so easy. It is a sharp P complete problem. Uh, but luckily, the number of objects we detect per image are not going to be that many. So we will have a 10 by 10 or a 20 by 20 matrix. So this can still be done very efficiently and there exist polynomial time approximation algorithms for this. So we, we have some uh, uh, exciting results on this showing that uh, distribution over a set of uh, semantic observations given a set of objects in, uh, around the uh, sensor can be, uh, this likelihood can be represented as the permanent of a, of a matrix which combines the likelihood of the observation and we can make things more complicated by introducing a model for, for clutter or misdetections and clutter rate uh, and, and so on. So this is the uh, this is the key observation that we can compute the weights of the like of the data association uh, using this permanent computation. And this is a very different, uh, or, or not very different, but it's a different view uh, compared to the hard matching that we saw in one of the uh, uh, in some of the other uh, presentations. So it's it's an alternative uh, approach. So so let's in the remaining one minute, let's quickly uh, see some results. So if we put all of this together. Uh, we can achieve things like tracking objects and, and also estimating the uh, positions of the key points and the uh, ellipsoid in the, uh, in, in the global frame. Uh, we can build a map of these uh, cars in the, uh, 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 in the 3D space and track the trajectory uh, of the sensor. Uh, in, in the end, we can produce something like this. So here are all the cars in sequence 00, zero of the kitty uh, odometry data set with their positions and orientations and ellipsoid uh, shape. As I mentioned, we can even do a, a mesh representation for the object. Uh, so, so we can uh, have a, a 3D mesh and, uh, uh, and measure the error with respect to the semantic segmentation. Uh, so here's an example of estimating the mesh and projecting it back 
into the uh, image frame here on the bottom and we can see kind of the, the shape of the car can be optimized uh, uh, over time. So in the last minute or, or maybe I'm over time, but I just wanted to summarize some uh, ideas for future work in relation to this uh, uh, workshop. So, so I think we should start thinking about uh, SLAM, which utilizes semantic information by defining an object state. So I think the question of what is an object is very key here. So an object state to me should capture pose, shape, appearance, kinematics, maybe affordances. So thinking about what is an object state and how do we define these new error functions which measure error between visual observations and object states is, uh, is important. So uh, I think it would be interesting to think about learning a representation for object shape instead of using meshes and, uh, uh, and ellipsoids and, and uh, things like capturing texture and motion and thinking about joint pose and uh, shape optimization. And uh, that, that's uh, all I have. And I'm happy to take questions. I think I'm probably over time. So I, I'll um, stop here. All right, thanks, Nikolai. Uh, yeah, we're gonna defer questions just so we can keep on schedule. Um, want to be sure to give the give time to Nathaniel Glasser. Uh, this is again one of our uh, submitted papers uh, that we wanted to spotlight. Um, so Nathaniel along with his co-authors uh, Yen Cheng Liu, Jun Jiaotian uh, working with Zolt Kira. Um, so it's one of the submitted papers that's looking at uh, how we can tie all of these threads together into a concrete application of trying to do data association perception across multiple platforms. All right so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nathaniel. Great. Yeah, thanks for the intro. And um, we can again. see your screen and we can hear you. So you're all set. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, again, my name is Nathaniel Glazer. Um, I'll be pre presenting our work, Enhancing Multi-Robot Perception via Learned Data Association. Uh, this work was done in the Ripple Lab at Georgia Tech. Individual robots are susceptible to occlusion, noise, and other degradations. However, multiple robots grant us information redundancy. As you can see in the figure, the robot on the bottom left is unable to observe the target scene due to an obstruction. However, its partners have clear views. Intuitively as humans, we know how to combine these two perspectives. Based on the unobstructed view, the letter to the left of B and C should be A. Our work explores how to encode the spatial contextual reasoning into a multi-robot perception pipeline. To this end, we ask the following question. How can we augment the visual observations of each robot with those of its neighbors? Specifically, we want to improve immediate egocentric perception, meaning for a single snapshot in time, how can each agent enhance its local inference, especially when it has access to the current observations of its neighbors? And actually, we have explored the task of collaborative perception in two other works from our lab. In these works, an agent must overcome full image degradation via compressed communication with its neighbors. These works also assumed known poses and hence known warping between viewpoints. On the other hand, for our current work, an agent must overcome localized degradation. Specifically, it must use the surrounding visual context to perform warping, and it must subsequently exchange compressed visual features to overcome this degradation. We call this new task collaborative perception via multi-agent and filling. In terms of scope, our work touches many domains. Image correspondence methods focus on matching visual features between frames. Optical flow and visual odometry methods perform a similar matching though under stricter camera motion assumptions. In-painting methods hallucinate plausible outputs for missing image regions. SLAM methods focus on building long-term representations or maps. And multi-view learning methods seek to fuse often static viewpoints towards some shared perception task. Our work takes inspiration from these domains while also introducing some distinctive twists. Specifically, we focus on the task of collaborative perception where agents must share a compressed form of visual information we use methods from image correspondence to identify matching context between two frames. However, unlike optical flow and visual odometry, we focus on a setting where viewpoints are often very different and weakly overlapping. And unlike most work in multi-view learning, we focus on a robotic setting where agents move through a dynamic environment. Unlike in-painting, we seek to overcome occlusions by not hallucinating a plausible replacement for the missing parts of an image, but by correctly extracting that information from supporting agents. And unlike SLAM, we focus on immediately improving local performance, not on building a long-term representation. Another distinctive feature of our work is that our method constitutes an end-to-end -end learnable solution. So what is our method? Well, to address our problem statement of how can we augment the visual observations of one robot with those of its neighbors, we came up with this simple formula. Basically, we add techniques from learned correspondence, image and painting, 
and semantic segmentation, we raise this combination to the multi-robot power. And that gives us main, the multi-agent and filling network. First, we adopt the learned cost volume approach of image correspondence methods. We compute a raw similarity volume between the extracted features of an agent pair. The argmax image on the left shows the best match of each cell in frame A to frame B. Notice the fuzzy rectangle in frame A is also reflected in this argmax image. This observation inspires our next design decision. Namely, we use methods from blind and painting to contextually smooth and infill the similarity volume, not the raw image observations. We use a small convolutional encoder-decoder network to transform the noisy similarity volume into a smoother volume that can then be used for warping features. Next, we have our network warped towards some perception task. In this case, we have the network produce a semantic segmentation mask. We use a variant on the SegNet architecture to produce this mask. Finally, we combine all these pieces together. Here we show the two agent case. First, we compute a raw similarity volume between frame A and frame B. Then we smooth this volume. Next, we take the argmax of this volume across the channel dimension, which provides us with a map for warping features from frame B into frame A. Then with the original frame A features, and the now aligned frame B features, we take the feature with a stronger matching score and forward it to the remainder of the SegNet architecture for semantic segmentation. Our method also extends to any number of agents. Here we perform context-based infilling and warping for each of the contributing feature maps. Then with the aligned feature maps, we use hard selection to forward the strongest spatial feature to the remainder of the network. So how do we test this method? Based on the proposed architecture, we need multiple views of the same scene. These are the only inputs that the network needs during training. However, uh, during training, we also need per pixel image correspondences and the desired perception ground truth, in our case, a semantic segmentation mask. Luckily, a simulator can provide all of this information. Specifically, we use AirSim as our simulator environment. Within this environment, we collected a total of six views from a swarm of three flying robots. This data set constitutes a relatively hard case for the multi-robot learning situation. The views are often non-overlapping and capture dynamic objects like cars and pedestrians. We have made this data set publicly available. We further adapt this data set into a multi-agent infilling variant. For this variant, we partially occlude one frame in the swarm, as shown in the figure on the right above agent N. Unfortunately, something is blocked in this frame, but we can use context clues to find the surrounding pattern in another agent. We can see that agent one's yellow school bus is what is missing from the frame of agent N. So at least for humans, there is sufficient information to infill the missing region. For a computer to learn this, we must provide a denser signal. In this case, we're able to use AirSim's pose and depth maps to compute per pixel dense correspondences. Additionally, from this variant, we introduce two data set splits. The sequence split includes image pairs captured sequentially from each agent. This split has substantial overlap between frames and serves as a visual odometry sanity check. The cross split includes snapshots from all six agents. This split constitutes the multi-robot perception case where there is intermittent and partial overlap between all observations. To evaluate our approach, we compute the mean intersection over union and mean accuracy scores within the degra degraded region of the image. We want to see how well the supporting agents can infill the degraded image region. We compared our main model against several baselines and performed an extensive ablation study. Here are some of the qualitative results. Each row represents a different data set case. The left two columns show the inputs to our main model. The third column shows the infilling baseline that attempts to hallucinate a plausible output for the degraded region. The fourth column shows the output of our main model. Unlike the infilling network, the main model can capture correct scene details, like the window in the top row, the road hashings in the middle row, and the obstructed car in the bottom row. And here are some of the quantitative results. Our main model outperforms the baselines and ablated variants on both the sequence and cross splits. Furthermore, we notice an interesting trend. Most baselines perform well on static objects for which there is a strong scene prior. However, the baseline models are unable to capture dynamic objects since they, since they only hallucinate a plausible output based on the scene prior. On the other hand, the main model is able to use surrounding context to exchange information relating to the degraded regions. And this success is reflected in its ability to accurately capture dynamic classes. So in conclusion, we propose a variant on the multi-agent perception task where robots must work together to overcome a localized image degradation, especially for large and dynamic viewpoint differences. We address this task via neural network architecture that uses context-based data association 
to exchange intermediate features within a segmentation network. And finally, we show that our network is able to learn embeddings that are suitable for cross-robot matching, generate a dense correspondence volume from these embeddings and perform context-based smoothing, and use the smooth correspondence to exchange features that are then decoded to satisfy the final perception task. And for future work, we plan on looking into more realistic environments, more realistic degradations, improved fusion mechanisms across agents, and bandwidth reduction via handshake communication. Um, that's it for the main part of the talk. Um, again, the lab that I work for is the Ripple Lab at Georgia Tech. I'm Nathaniel Glazer. Um, here are a couple of links for the lab website and the data set page. And before we go on to questions, I'll go ahead and kick it off by uh, sort of discussing what I think are the core strengths and core weaknesses of the work. Um, specifically, I think something that we do well is that we, uh, we have an egocentric algorithm where each agent performs computations that enhance local perception. It's also opportunistic, meaning that each agent benefits from information exchange, but full connectivity to all other agents is not required. And it also paralyzes the computing. Um, the encoding of features and computation of similarity is done per agent on the local platform. And it's also scalable, so we can easily add any number of new agents. Um, but unfortunately, this leads to the, the problem, some of the core weaknesses, which is that it does use dense correspondences as part of the algorithm, meaning that we have to perform, perform expensive cost volume calculation between all candidate pairs. And also, we only test with artificial degradations. Um, specifically, we use this Gaussian noise degradation. Um, but it would be interesting to see more plausible um, occlusions and degradations present in the data set. And finally, we tested on clean simulator data, um, which prov provided us with very accurate ground truth dense correspondences and uh, pose and depth information. Um, it would be very interesting to look at this work in the context of realistic data um, for robotics. Um, and that's it for the presentation. Uh, I'm open for questions. All right, with that good C for discussion, um, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat or you can raise your hand in the chat window and we can unmute you to ask your question to Nathaniel directly. Uh, so Nathaniel, I can start off with a question. Um, so you're targeting a multi-agent perception problem. You know, as we think about practical application, the networking is gonna be a key limiting factor here. So what do you think are gonna be the challenges that you're gonna face with respect to trying to actually communicate the information back and forth between the different platforms? Like what's gonna mm -hmm. drive the communication requirements? Hmm. Yeah, so bandwidth will probably be a large limiting factor for communicating uh, like in actual realistic scenarios. Um, and part of what our lab has worked with in the past is uh, trying to compress the information that is exchanged between agents. Um, so rather than trying to transmit entire feature maps or entire uh, like image observations, Maybe we can instead transmit compressed feature maps in more compressed forms of this information. Um, this constitutes, uh, this, this takes the form of like embeddings, uh, feature embeddings um, that are compressed, but like very rich in their information content. Um, so that's how I see this work extending towards the future, which is just using learnable features and learnable things for communication um, to improve perception performance across several agents. Okay, thank you. Um... Are there any more questions? So I have a I have a quick question, Isan. Yes, yeah. please um, go ahead, Kava. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, uh, do you need to know the relative poles of the UAVs with respect to each other in order to kind of leverage and uh, fuse their images and in paint, or, or mm -hmm. do you not require that information? So we require that information only during training, and actually during inference, when you actually deploy these models, it is not required. Um, we are learning like a front end perception pipeline for how to warp, warp like pixel by pixel features from one frame to the other frame. We don't need the pose information. And then, and then have you had a chance to test and see what happens if two vehicles are far from each other in terms of like the, the, the view that they're, the viewpoint that they have is considerably mm -hmm. different. Maybe like some ve one vehicle is looking at one side of the object, the other one is like completely on the other side. I, I expect that at some point it becomes more challenging to paint and fuse these images. Yeah, it definitely becomes more challenging. And that's one area where our work does perform well. Um, as part of the data set that we used, it's this data set collected inside AirSim. And we've made sure that only some of these agents actually have overlap um, with their observations. Probably, so we have six agents total in the environment. And we'll have like on average, maybe two agents actually looking at the same part of the scene. Um, sometimes there's no overlap at all between the agents. 
And the algorithm is able to ignore that irrelevant information when it's trying to produce a local semantic segmentation mask. Um, so that is a benefit of our, our algorithm that it's able to overcome that. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, are there any other questions? Okay. So everybody's fine for now. Um, thanks a lot, Nathaniel. We really appreciated the submission. All right, Kava, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, so we can start our closing thoughts and close out the workshop. Yeah, uh, thanks, Susan, for uh, chairing this session. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share screen here. So we're uh, at the end of our last session, uh, and I want to thank all the speakers in this session for their fantastic presentation uh, and uh, basically wrapping up and uh, going to to uh, conclude concluding remarks uh, want to again highlight that uh, you can go to the workshop website and uh, the link to the talks that you saw today is uh, available there so uh, the talks were live streamed on IEEE TV at the address that you're seeing here. Uh, and uh, we've been told that the, at the end of the session uh, and very soon after that, the, the entire uh, workshop will be uh, recorded and made available on IEEE TV at the link address that you're seeing here. So uh, you can have uh, you have access to the talks and feel free to share them with uh, anyone who you think might be interested. Uh, so again, I wanna thank all of the speakers uh, that came here this Sunday. Some of them, uh, it was for them quite late at night, uh, but but they came here, they asked us questions. We're very grateful for that. Uh, I'm very thankful to the uh, to, to, to our workshop organizers, John, Alec, Ethan, Roberto, uh, for uh, all their helps in organizing this workshop. Uh, and uh, also, I'm very grateful to IEEE, uh, IEEE uh, conference uh, uh, workshop uh, chairs, in particular Samir, for uh, helping us to organize this online uh, workshop, and uh, also uh, at uh, also at Steve for helping us figure out the IEEE uh, TV. So we're very grateful to you. Uh, and I want to hand it over to other organizers so they can also say uh, their concluding remarks. But before that, just want to say that if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us. I believe that this was uh, perhaps one of the first uh, data association workshops in recent ECRA and IRAS conferences, as far as I'm aware of. So if you like the talks, if you want to see another workshop in future on the same topic, please reach out to us, give us feedback, and your, uh, your feedback will be very encouraging for us to try to host another workshop. So John, would you like to uh, take it over? Sure, thank you, Kevin. Um, well, congratulations, everybody, and a, a fantastic day. It was excellent listening to all these talks. Uh, and I would just like to say uh, congratulations to Kave for setting up uh, this workshop. He's put a lot of effort and time into it. Uh, it's turned out uh, excellently. I see there's still over 100 participants now. I think we peaked up around 165 or so, middle of the day. Uh, so that's fantastic to see that amount of excitement and interest. I think it's just been a great set of talks to listen to. Um, and a funny quirk really of just doing it this way is not the way we wanted to do it, but it's been, been able to reach out to many more people than we would have had uh, had we been in, in uh, Paris. So, well, as uh, I think Roberto said, we don't get to sit in a Paris cafe and have uh, fine coffee and, uh, and snacks. Uh, on the other hand, um, this is uh, probably, like I say, a better way to reach out to the community as it turns out. So anyway, Kevin, congratulations to you for excellent work setting this up. I think it's turned out uh, really, really well. Good job. Of course, thank you. My pleasure. Ethan. Sure. Thanks, Kava. And I'll uh, I'll echo John's sentiments that you did an excellent job getting things pulled together here with all the transition slides and everything. So thanks a lot for that. Um, thanks again to the speakers. So I'll just harken back to the what I started with the opening comments. So I think you can you can get a sense of kind of why this topic is really interesting, right? We managed to cover all those four different topics where we were looking at 
with algorithmic developments from a, you know, purely looking at the problems, the optimization problems that were there and advances in, in, in structuring and in solving those problems. We looked at learning based techniques, we looked at applications that are demanding of data associations and how important those applications are. And then how, you know, people are already pioneering ways to tie all those things together and try to put together learning based techniques together with, you know, the core algorithmics in order to make things that work robustly and actually solve the applications that we're interested in. Um, so this is, you know, this I think is going to be one of the big success stories of the revolutions in deep learning um, for, for, as an avenue to AI. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, get everybody to talk about these these pieces together. Uh, it's going to be an important step in that. So thanks. Thanks again to everybody. Thank you, Sen. Uh, Roberto, are you there? Yes. So first, thank you, Cave. You put a lot of energy and effort in this workshop. It was great to be part of it. Thank you for all your work. And My I pleasure. really enjoyed the workshop. I think it it really came out. It was very clear what uh, are, what is the state of the art uh, of this interesting problem class of problems, and uh, I got many ideas of like where are the missing pieces to put many different lines of work together. So it was great. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for uh, also all your help in in terms of organizing the workshops and the uh, and the papers that was submitted. Uh, so again, I think I saw one question in the from the audience that were asking if the if the talks are going to be available. Uh, so yes, they will be available at the link that you're seeing there at IEEE TV. Uh, shortly after the end of the session, they they will post the entire recorded talk there, and you can go there and uh, pick up your favorite presentation to watch again. Uh, so with that, we're at the end of the. Uh, workshop and the end of the event today. Uh, again, I wish you all uh, health and I hope you stay safe uh, in this pandemic and hopefully in future we'll see face to face and, and shake hands and uh, uh, hopefully I'll see you in uh, future conferences. Uh, have a good evening everyone and uh, stay safe. <laughs>